For more than a decade, Saturdays and Illegal Curve have been synonymous with one another. With insight, analysis, and interviews regarding the Winnipeg Jets, the Manitoba Moose, and all around the NHL, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mandel. The Illegal Curve Hockey Show starts now. The winning streak for the Winnipeg Jets has reached two games, yet they haven't actually won a game in the win column. Good morning, Winnipeg. Good morning, Manitoba. For all those joining us live this morning on our YouTube channel and all of our social media platforms, we say good morning, universe, and welcome to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. With Dave Manuk, with Ezra Ginsberg, I'm your host, Drew Mandel, here for the next couple of hours. Talk about everything to do with the Winnipeg Jets. A busy weekend in store. The Jets in South Florida to face the Panthers later tonight, which means it's a doubleheader of Illegal Curve today with the Illegal Curve Hockey Show right now and of course the illegal curve post game show in about 12 hours time then we do it all again tomorrow 24 hour or about 36 hours from now after the jets and the tampa bay lightning Drew, what are you going to be doing 51 hours from now 51 hours from now probably sleeping i see people wondering if i've suffered a massive head injury in the lead up to my intro and that's totally fair but the winnipeg jets despite not playing a game since tuesday Wednesday, pardon me, Wednesday, have two huge wins for them in that both the Arizona Coyotes and the Anaheim Ducks defeated the Jets' closest rivals, giving the Jets, in a roundabout way, significant victories. The Jets might not be able to win themselves, but as long as the guys who are right behind them keep losing, they're going to be in a playoff spot. So the Jets, I'm sure, owe a debt of gratitude to the Coyotes for defeating the Nashville Predators on Thursday night, and then last night, the Anaheim Ducks somehow defeating the Calgary Flames in Calgary, putting the Jets, uh, giving the Jets a little bit of uh, breathing room, not a lot, But imagine where the standings would look like today had the Predators and the Flames taken care of business. The big two points. It for sure the big two points. Maybe the Jets will send John Gibson, uh, because he was phenomenal last night, maybe they'll send Gibson like an edible arrangement or something. Yeah, I was going to say, Drew, it's it's very easy to say how do they win. His name is John Gibson, and I believe he passed J.S. Chiguerre in uh, terms of total saves for the the Ducks uh, organization. And I, I often tout... Uh, Connor Hellebuck is facing the most shots since he became a uh, full-time NHLer in 15-16. Right behind him on that list are two players. One is Andre Vasilevsky, which kind of proves the whole when everybody says the Jets' defense sucks. They go, no, it just means he plays a lot, I, a la Andre Vasilevsky. And John Gibson. John Gibson is, is two or three on that list. So John Gibson, was he's an excellent goalie. He's kind of languishing in uh, Anaheim, unfortunately for him. Mm-hmm. But uh, they all, they all the, as as he said, he was excellent. He got double the flames, doubled up the Ducks in shots. But it was the Ducks who came away victorious. And so you're right. That's uh, that's a big win for 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 the Jets by virtue of their closest rivals losing. No, well, and, and obviously, sorry, I was just going to say, you know, Drew, you're obviously, you know, half joking, not joking in the sense that you know the the Ducks did the Jets a favor here. But, you know, it, in the sense of the Jets controlling their own destiny, right? And the Jets have 17 games left. They're the ones that are in a playoff position, right? It's the Flames and the Predators yeah. who don't control their own destiny in the sense of, you know, they are hoping that the Jets lose, right? So both all these teams are hoping that the other team loses. But that's why these next three games on the road trip uh, and all remaining games for that matter, all 17 remaining games are important um, because of how, how tight it is, right? Like the Jets can still, in theory, finish second in the Central. I think first in the central is completely uh, out of reach because they're what seven or eight points back now. Eight. So I think first place, yeah, there you go. So eight points back. I I don't think a lot of people think the Jets are catching Dallas. Maybe they will, but they're probably going to have to go something like you know thirteen and four or twelve and five to to catch the the Stars for first. So they can easily finish second or third in the Central, Dave. And you know it begins tonight against Florida. Florida beat Chicago last night, but they're in the mm-hmm. second game of a back to back. And then Tampa Bay is also going to play Chicago tonight. So they're going to get the lightning in the second game of a back-to-back. So these are winnable games coming up. Well, there, you look, the 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 competition level, uh, you know, is, is significant. 
not overwhelmingly so. It's not Boston and Carolina Tuesday, mm-hmm. Thursday of next week. You got a Florida Panthers team that is scratching and clawing uh, to be a playoff team. They're currently just outside of the wild card race in the they won three down, conference. They were down. Sorry, Drew. Uh, they were down two nothing mm-hmm. yesterday, and they had to tie it up in the third period. And then Brandon Montour scored in overtime, so they they almost lost last night's game. And they but they've won they've won three in a row. Right, so they're playing decent hockey, and although they although they don't have games, they the other teams ahead of them have games in hand. So I believe the Islanders ahead of them, and even the the Senators behind them. No, the uh, the so the Islanders uh, are. I thought they played more. I thought they played two more games than, than the Senators and one more than the Islanders. Senators and the Panthers. The Islanders. Dave, just go to NHL.com and then click the standings tab, and it'll give you all the teams Drew, that are. Drew, you've never sa- Drew, Drew, you've never sounded so good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. No, because your your thing went a little haywire. Oh, okay. It didn't go haywire on my end, but uh, nonetheless, uh, look, the, the the Jets know where they are in the standings. They know that they got a reprieve uh, in the losses that we just touched on, the losses by Calgary, the losses by Nashville. Uh, I would think that that, prob- that loss to Arizona should probably put an end to Nashville, uh, but you know they still do have a couple games in hand, and it, it's incumbent on the Jets. How many, how many hat tricks can Tyson Berry get, Drew? Like, come on. But, but it, it, you know, we talk about the teams losing that are be- behind them, but it's incumbent on the Jets to to find a way now. They, they got mm-hmm. a bit of a reprieve, so now can you take advantage of it? You're rested. You know, Flor- Florida played last night. Now, there's no travel involved. We know that. Florida played at home last night, and they're going to be playing at home tonight. But the Jets were sitting there. They were waiting. They're rested. They haven't played since Wednesday. They had a couple days off. They had a practice yesterday. It- it- it's incumbent now on the Jets to take the game they played, really for the last two games. You know, take the games they played against San Jose and the game they played against Minnesota and translate that into victories. Everything else is just hollow words. It's just empty, meaningless cliches. Isn't that what a legal curve is? Hollow words? Yes, but we're not getting paid millions of dollars to do it. We're getting paid thousands of dollars to do it. But the point is the it's it's well, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a separate issue entirely. We'll take that up with the business. Well, Drew, 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 we're paying you some peanuts. money then. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're giving him peanuts. Stop it. What are you doing? <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's uh, You didn't hear that part, Ezzy. You didn't hear any of that. The point is the Jets are, they need to take advantage of this now. You need and points. You need wins, Drew. You absolutely need wins, and right. it starts tonight. It, it, it has right. to start tonight. And you're right. If if you don't win, I mean, like ideally, you want to win all three of these games. I think it's going to be really hard. Three games in four days, especially the game against Carolina, scares me even more. Right, just because of the fact that the Hurricanes are one of the best teams in the league. But you know, at the very least, you have to get two wins. I think out of these games. Like I said, they're going to try to win all three of these games on the road. But you you have to make up for you know the losses at home and you have to take advantage of the fact that the flames lost like last night and the predators lost last night because if you lose tonight then i mean again you know it's like that flames loss never happened right that's just it you know calgary loses a winnable game nashville loses a a winnable game this isn't you know the jets look they they dominated florida earlier in the year when everything was going well for them they actually played they, they if i recall correctly they handled tampa bay relatively easily uh, when everything was going well for them earlier in the year as well. So it's not like they haven't had success against these two teams. Now, we know the limited success they've had against the Eastern Conference uh, as of late and by and large this season. But that, none of, nonetheless, if you play like you played on Wednesday against the Wild with a little bit more scoring touch, mm-hmm. good things should occur for you. Mm-hmm. And this would be an opportunity. The next This weekend is an opportunity to maybe – start to feel good about yourself. I, you know, I, I read with interest the quote yesterday from, from, from Blake Wheeler, who doesn't speak as often as he did when he was the captain. And that's understandable, but he said, uh, you know, this is courtesy of Mike McIntyre. And I think Kenny Weeb is also on the trip. Um, you know, he said, you know, and here's the quote, quote, great teams are forged in fire, which is, you know, a, a, a saying where great you know, TV show forged in fire is a great TV show. Yeah. Where they make uh, swords. Oh, I haven't tuned in. I yeah, it's like who who can make the best like like, history medieval channel. sword? Yeah, history oh. channel. Great I show. Forged swords, in fire. Yeah. knives, axes. Yeah. Okay, all these these are all important things that I should. I guess it's knives, not swords, right? Well, they make swords too. I, I think guess they're they swords. Yeah, I know Drew like, likes a good Bowie knife. A little dagger, well, I, if you will. I, I would argue that a, a a sword. You know that I would argue that any sword is a knife, but all uh, not all knives are swords. I would but, disagree with that statement, actually. Really? And, and if you and you keep going, I'm going to take a, a sword and lop your head off. So let's talk hockey. 
<laughs> but so that was the quote from Blake Wheeler. So it's a great opportunity for us to stick to de- stick together and deal with some adversity. Sticking together, not pointing fingers, just taking responsibility for what's what transpired the last little bit, Wheeler said. Obviously, when you're going through a tough stretch, you've got to walk that fine line of squeezing too hard and pushing too hard and still bringing confidence to the table. When you're playing your best hockey, you don't feel like you're forcing it or trying hard. You're just kind of able to go out and play. It's kind of a tightrope act. But I think for the veteran guys on the team, it's a matter of giving a lot of confidence and enthusiasm in the dressing room. Longest so, quote ever. Well, it was it was a couple paragraphs, certainly, but that's Blake Wheeler yesterday. And, you. I, and I think he's, you know, I think he's hitting the right note. He's, he's saying the right things, yeah. which, again, is what you would expect. And, and it, but the words themselves, of course, are meaningless until the game like the old Dustin, Drew, it's like the Dustin Bufflin quote that uh, Nicole is currently got. If we stick together as like a group, a, we'll be fine. Yeah, great quote, Nicole. Exa- yeah. It, Best no of question. all time. It was to play that at the end of each show, or we used to play that at some point. At at one point on TSN 1290, every show we used to play always the Foo Fighters, right? Yeah. And then uh, to the extra, and then we always used to do it. uh, If if, as long as we stick together, we'll be all right. So that's a classic buff. No, you're right, Drew. I mean, look at, I mean, the the Panthers, you know, we talked about they're fighting tooth and nail. They're going to be desperate, but they played last night. What I think is going to be interesting, I was telling Dave before we went off air. Sergey Bobrovsky got the win last night for the Panthers, mm-hmm. but he only had to make, I think, 18 saves or 19 saves. Mm-hmm. Alex Lyon is the backup now, but he hasn't played since the end of January because Spencer Knight is in the player assistance program. Yeah. And obviously we hope he gets better real soon. And so, you know, maybe Bobrovsky plays tonight, but you got to think it's going to be Alex Lyon just because it's the second game of a back-to-back. So we'll see what happens. But I mean, Lyon is a veteran backup goalie. So that's a bit of a boost for the Jets. And, and I think, you know, when you consider the, all the talk about the power play, I agree. I saw a few comments, Dom Zappia and others talking about the power play. Mm-hmm. I mean, forget, forget, you know, who's out there and, you know, which unit. Like, they just have to start scoring goals. Good thing for them is the Panthers have a bottom five PK in the league. Well, that's certainly, you're, you're absolutely right, though, Ezzy. I mean, the power play can be a catalyst for this team to get going because we know how difficult it's been to score goals, Dave, but the power play itself has been just such a glaring weakness for this team. Yeah. And I know that if you just looked at the raw numbers, you'd say, okay, well, they're middle of the pack or they're probably closer to the bottom third of the league I at think this they're, point in They're time. either 17 or 18 now. Yeah, so, you know, but, you know, it's been so... When this team has desperately needed a goal, the power play has not been there for them. Yeah. So you wonder, you know, and, and again, I, I, I'm... I'm not in. I'm not in love with the power play deploy, deployment and the fact that Nikolai Ehlers is still on that second power play unit. And we'll yeah. touch about that a little bit later. There was a really interesting Twitter thread talking about the uh, Jets power play and where players are shooting from and where mm-hmm. they're positioned. That might give some insight into that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. But you know, they need some good. They need good vibes early in tonight's game because I yep. do feel based on how they played on Monday Mm -hmm. and based on how they played on Wednesday, they're not far off. And I know they only got one out of three points or one out of four points, pardon me. But the way they played those two games, I don't think they're as far off as they were, uh, say maybe two weeks ago uh, when they just, they looked like they were being outclassed, like the game in Edmonton, for example, where they just had nothing or that on that Eastern conference, on that Eastern conference road trip, where they just, where you know the only win they got was because Hellebuck was was insane. So I don't right. think they're that far off, at least based on their games earlier this week. But now let's see if they can translate that moving forward, Dave. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment, Drew. And I think if you're the Jets, you overall feel good about your the way you played the last couple of games, despite the results. Now you're no longer in a position where you have the luxury for hollow uh, talking points, you mm-hmm. know, in the media availabilities, and say, well, you know, we liked our game. How many times do we hear that statement where it was like we liked our game? It's like, yeah. well. That's all well and good, but you're no longer in a position, as we've like talked about, yeah. to like your game. This is this is a team that has squandered, and I think that's a fair use of that word, mm-hmm. uh, their opportunity that they provided themselves because they won so many games in the first 30, right? When you win 20 games of your first 30, you give yourself that cushion. The standings bank is full. But when you start to use up the funds in your standings bank, you got to replenish them or you're going to be broke. And in this instance, broke means out of the playoffs. So – you're, you're now feeling good about the way things have, have gone of late, you know, and look, we've credited the goaltenders of the opposition because they played excellent, right? James mm-hmm. Reimer was fantastic in that game against the Jets. So 
it, it's it's not like the Jets didn't have chances. Now, I agree with you. I think the power play has really hurt them. Yeah. I mean, when you go zero for nine in your power play, it's a really bad, it just it kills your momentum and gives the other team, you know, uh, a little boost when they can when they can do it. And now the biggest thing is, and we talked about it, San Jose's power penalty kill was phenomenally aggressive. Yeah. But like the fact is the Jets were also, I would say for them, especially phenomenally slow yeah. and they weren't quick with their movement. And as a result, San Jose was able to get to them every single time. And the Jets, it was predictable, right? You knew where they were going. You knew where they were shooting from. And so it's like, again, and I know you're going to talk about it after, yeah. but it's just one of those things that that's the, probably the biggest area where the Jets need to get that bounce, right? Because they also need the save. They need the save off of bad goal because that's been hurting them the love late. You know, David Riddich gives up a bad goal. That first goal, that was a, a goal he should have stopped. Yeah. You know, Connor Hellebuck, that third goal, especially the first one, maybe, but the third one, especially shouldn't be beating Connor Hellebuck. And actually, if you haven't read it, uh, frequent I see ghost, um, ghost. I was going to say, I see, see ghost. ghost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. A is, woman who uh, cleaned our house once told me, uh, this is like three years uh, ago. As he's got uh, women cleaning his house. Somebody's whoa, doing well. Da -dee -da. No, no, no. Da -dee -da, Mr. Well, 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 well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drew, I clean my house every day. Okay. And then someone comes every four weeks. Um, but the, the, the same person, hey, wait a second, Ezzie, can, that, Ezzie, can that person come to my house and clean up after you with all the stains <laughs> you've left in my main floor? Okay, guys, <laughs> let's just get back to the, the story here. She doesn't clean her house anymore, but this is a true story. You can ask Naomi uh, or all the people the that I've person told who's trying to clean his house. No, Jeez. no, no, they weren't, they weren't fired. Nothing like that. But as she was leaving, she said, do you know that you have two ghosts in your house? I don't know oh, if I've told fun. you guys the story before. And I was like, those oh, just really? Kids, like, Ezzie. Pardon me? Those are just yeah. your kids. No, but, told her, those are just but anyways, so, so, she, so I said, okay, fine. Like, I I, I, I don't not believe in ghosts, I guess. But, I, but so my obvious question was what? I said, well, are they friendly ghosts? Because there's a difference, right? There's bad ghosts and good ghosts. So For she sure. said they're friendly. So I was okay. I was like, okay, I can I can live with a couple friendly ghosts. But if she was like, no, 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 no. Like someone died in your basement, I'd be like, oh, okay. Like that's kind of creepy. So yeah, apparently I have a couple of friendly ghosts in my basement. Well, there you go. Anyways, this guy is not a friendly ghost, but he was a former Notice NHL... that Dave just got complete, went right back to his thought. Like, he yeah. just completely ignored that. I'm not sure what we can do with your, with your ghost uh, tag. Well, Dave was the one that brought up ghosts, so I thought I'd tell I my did. ghost story. I did, only because I had a brain fart. But anywho, now let's talk about farts. We can talk about so, Ghostbusters, Dave. <laughs> talk about ghost farts. Uh, as he's let out a few of those, I can attest. So the point is that we've got uh, uh, Mike McKenna, former NHL goalie, pro goalie, Played in the AHL, of course. and was on the show two weeks ago. was on the show a couple weeks ago. He wrote an excellent article about Connor Hellebuck. So uh, for Daily Faceoff, I've got it linked in yesterday's uh, morning paper. So give that one a read if you want to have some insight from a former goalie on what seems to be going wrong with Connor Hellebuck of late. But we know it's not just Connor Hellebuck. We know that the Jets' defense has been not very good considering how tight they were for the first 30, 40 games of the season to the way they've been of late. So again, there's a number of factors that are coming in, right? They're letting, allowing more inner slot shots. They're doing a lot of the things that they weren't doing when they were getting the wins. And, and again, that's part of the team not following the system that the coach has implemented and, and really going away from it. And so because you've gone away from it, you're not winning. Maybe here's a crazy idea. Return to what was successful for you, not trying to, you know, improvise and do some new things. So I think that, that if, you, if you can follow that system, if Connor Hellebuck can get back to where Connor Hellebuck plays, and as as he said on the last show, Connor Hellebuck tends to respond after a disappointing effort, and you know he was disappointed with that effort. So you expect Connor Hellebuck to be probably the Connor Hellebuck we're used to watching. Mm -hmm. You expect the Jets to maybe be a little bit better defensively, and you want to see if the power play is different. If those three things change, that's a very good chance the Jets come away with two points. Yeah, uh, it, you know that's just it. I mean, everything that that they need to succeed is controllable and, and, and it, and it's sitting right there for them. I mean, I would expect a Connor Hellebuck bounce back. I mean, it, it's, it's unlike him to go through an extended stretch of mediocrity. Like he's been as of late. So I he's do always played better after a bad game. Yeah. His, his record is really impressive. Right. And yeah, I don't think you're, I think you're going to see the best of Connor Hellebuck tonight. I would expect that. I mean, the, here's Rick bonus yesterday. Uh, the guys know that we're playing a lot better the last couple of games. No one is happy that we lost three of those points when we played so well, clearly. But the most important thing is feel good about how the team game was and the team games 
uh, if this is the quote, we'll deal with the poor English later. And the team games was very good for both of those games. So, you know, I think you know what he's trying to say there. Maybe got a little bit muddled in the in the messaging. Maybe Dave's maybe he, ghost, maybe he uh, should download, download uh, Grammarly. Well, maybe Dave's ghost infected his brain there a little bit. But uh, whatever it might be, the Jets, they know how important this weekend is. Because it's absolutely crucial. A win tonight, given the, the the losses by Calgary and by Nashville, you know that puts you, it gives you even more buffer. It potentially could even leapfrog you past Colorado. The Avalanche aren't playing great hockey. Of course, the Avalanche have Arizona tonight. So again, Arizona would be doing So that means that. the Coyotes are going to win. <laughs> Six nothing well, Arizona final. Yeah. Well, it's, it's well some of these games make happen. absolutely no sense. Like yeah. Anaheim beating Calgary last night makes no sense. Well, I mean that that one you can. Well, John Gibson, it. obviously, that's yeah. why. But I mean, Calgary. If if the Flames end up missing the playoffs, they can just point to games like that and be like, "Oh, if we would have just beat the worst team, I'm pretty sure the Ducks are the worst team record wise in the league. If not, they're you know second worst or third worst, right?" So San Jose, San Jose and Chicago are actually San Jose is uh, worse than they are, but Columbus is the but worst. That's because they the got the win yesterday, right? Right. Columbus is the worst in the league. Right. Yeah. Connor Bedard's going there, I think, Drew. And that's, I'm sure, where the NHL wants him is in, 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 in a small market like Columbus. Well, Bedard sure. feeding Line and Goudreau, that would be pretty awesome. Well, it certainly would be for the Columbus fans. And I like Columbus. They do. They deserve uh, They deserve some good fortune uh, smiling their way, certainly. Uh, but look, the, we know where we're at in, this cor- in the course of the season at this point. There's no reinforcements coming. There's no more trade deadline that's beyond us that's in the rearview mirror. Well, Cole Perfetti is going to come back eventually. but Well, but he's not coming back until the playoffs if the Jets get to the playoffs. And then what condition is he in at that point in time? So relying on Cole Perfetti. Dude, yes, he's, he's not a used car. He's a human being. I'm aware. But relying on Cole Perfetti to all of a sudden be the catalyst that, that you know, uh, turns your season if you squeak into the playoffs is sure. just not realistic given that he's, you know, basically a first-year NHL player. Not basically. He is a first-year NHL player. I mean, Cole Perfetti is going to add to the depth of the of the roster, and he's going to give you another, uh, another playmaker, and that's a great thing to have. Don't get me wrong. But to expect Cole Perfetti to all of a sudden step in, maybe in the first round of the playoffs, and, and, and put the team on his back is not realistic. It's what we've talked about, and we talked about it on Wednesday's postgame show, and there, I believe uh, Mike uh, McIntyre wrote it in his column this week. It's incumbent on the Jets' best players at this point in time. You know, you know Nito oh, Niederreiter's has yeah, come I mean, in. Look, look at Kyle Connor, Blake Wheeler, yeah. uh, Mark Shifley. I mean, it's unfortunate they don't have Pierre-Luc Dubois, but a guy like Vladislav Nemesnikov, like yeah. th- it's a big responsibility for him centering that second line. Right, like, but- the, Nikolai Ehlers, these guys have to produce. There's no doubt about that. You're right. Right. Like in the Mesnikov, Niederreiter, they've come in, they've done everything you could you would ask them. Niederreiter, especially in the Mesnikov's a good veteran guy, can play up and down. You know, he's not going to be again, he's not going to be a driver in your top six, uh, because he's not suited for that role. He's there right now because of circumstances, because Pierre Luc Dubois is out of the lineup. So you have some adversity. And even Blake Wheeler touched on that adversity uh in his comments yesterday. Uh let me see if I can find it here real quick. Uh where was it? Sorry, I had it right here somewhere. Um, sorry, I had it right here. Okay, I'll find it afterwards. But I mean that the you know the 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 important part is that the Jets' best players need to be their best players starting tonight. Yes, they need yeah. to be the ones who score. They need to be the ones who are driving the play. Look, Florida and for the rest of the season, by the way, like oh, not this just team, tonight. If this yes. team is going to get into the playoffs. Yeah, like I agree with you, Drew Perfetti. You know, at earliest is going to come back. It sounds like in the first round of the playoffs, right? Right. So he's not coming back for this stretch run here. No. So yeah, you you have to start getting goals from the Shifleys and the Connors and the Ealers, and you know you'd like to get some offense from the back end as as well. I mean, Josh Morrissey's been doing it all year, but it'd be nice if you know Neil Pionk chipped in offensively. Like it's it's the power play, it's the goal scoring. You know, obviously, you know Hellebuck has to be better than he was uh, last game, and you expect him to to be better tonight because he always responds well after a bad game. But mm-hmm. yeah, if the Jets ultimately end up squeaking into the playoffs, it's going to be because these guys start scoring. Like, I don't know what the numbers are, but doesn't Kyle Connor only have one goal in his last 10 games or something yeah. like that? Yeah. So I, I'm looking at a guy like, and, and obviously Connor has produced offensively for the Jets for many years now, but if there's one guy that I would say has to break out offensively on this road trip, it's Connor. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with I was that. Just gonna, I, Drew, Go I was ahead. just going to add before we had to break uh, that, you know, if someone asked about Pierre-Luc Dubois, he's definitely missing the two games in Florida. Yeah. Uh, the hope was that he would join the team on at some point on this road trip. 
But um, Rick Bonus said yesterday that he was he ruled him out for both tonight's game and tomorrow night's game. Mm-hmm. So my guess is the team is hoping he'll come on Monday and maybe be able to play against Carolina, which would be a big boost for this Jets club against a tough uh, Carolina team. But of course, like you guys are saying, you got to focus on what you're what's right in the head in front of you, and that is the Florida Panthers. And you have to take advantage of your opportunities. And as he's 100 percent right. Like we talk about the role players and the and the you know we went through a laundry list of guys who hadn't scored in 30 games, 20 games, and 10 games, 15 games, and that's all well and good. And we talk about how you need secondary scoring, but yeah. primary scoring is primarily what you need in this league, and that means that the guys who are paid the big bucks and are on the top lines and get the lion's share of minutes are the guys who have to contribute for you. So if Kyle Connor hasn't scored in in eight games and Mark Shifley hasn't scored in se- you know one goal in seven games, like that that adds up right? Or it doesn't add up, I should say. It adds up to zero. And that zero means you don't get a lot of wins when those guys aren't producing. So it's all well and good to to, to expect more from your role players. And I mm-hmm. think you should. And we talk about it too much, how the Jets think still top six, bottom six, as opposed to top nine and a, and a fourth line that, that can that can hold their own and 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 check. But right now, it's it's right now it's a bottom four because uh, the all lines aren't really producing. And that's what you need. And so, look, without uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois, you're going to have to um, tread water a little bit in that regard. And Nemestikov has, has stepped in. He's kind of tried to fill that role admirably. But at the end of the day, Mark Shifley, Kyle Connor, yeah. Nikolai Ehlers, those are your big guns. Mm-hmm. And those are the guys who are going to have to get it done for you. Last word to Wheeler. I found the quote. We probably played our best hockey, ironically, when we weren't fully healthy in the early part yeah, of the season. That. It's yeah. nothing new for our team. We've been battling through it all year. And it's obviously difficult when you're losing the caliber the caliber of players that we're missing right now. But it's just a matter of guys are getting opportunities now. So the opportunity is there. Will the Jets be able to capitalize on it? Because a reminder, it's not like this Florida Panthers team is a defensive juggernaut or anything. This is a Paul Maurice coach team, which means the chances will be high and they'll be back and forth more likely tonight in terms of instead of a defensive uh, stalwart kind of uh, contest. When Kyle we're... Connor, sorry, I'm just going to say, Connor, I forgot he scored against LA. Connor's got one goal in his last eight games, uh, no goals in his last four games, but he has six shots in his last two games. So I I, I do expect Connor to to light the lamp uh, tonight, but, but the point is that he's not scoring at the same rate that you're expecting. So And as he had five of those, in, he, he had five of those in the first period. Right. Yeah. Not enough for the Jets. We'll see what they if they can turn it around tonight against the Florida Panthers post game show right around eight forty five or so tonight. Join the three of us back here for that when we return after the commercial break. Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press for more Jets talk. It's a Saturday morning. Drew Mendel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsberg with you. We're live on YouTube and all of our social media platforms. Bottom of hour number one. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mendel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsberg with you on this not quite yet snow. Saturday morning, but apparently it's coming. Who knows if that's actually going to happen or not? Don't forget, Drew. Though we're springing forward tonight. I know it's, it's spring is apparently spring. Spring is but, here, but the blizzard is also blizzarding. So I'm just confused as to what's going to happen. But I know one thing that's going to happen for sure. Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press is going to join us there now is. on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. As I said, set your clocks to hammer time. Jeff <laughs> Hamilton is here. Good morning, Jeffrey. Morning, gentlemen. How are we doing? Doing well. How are you? Things in your world? Things are good. Just I uh, got a few days off here, but enjoying the the Jets uh, being on the road. My, as you guys have mentioned a couple times, Mike's handling that, and uh, I got till Wednesday off. So I've been just doing some stuff around the house, getting ready for tax season. And uh, do you and, have any uh, ghosts? Yeah, and watching my my nephew play. Uh, he's playing in provincials right now for high school hockey. And um, awesome. Nice. Yeah. So it's been uh, it's been a a, a, a nice. Not hockey free, but uh, nice weekend nonetheless. Proud Uncle Jeff uh, showing up at the games to cheer on your nephew. And they don't hit anymore, by the way. Uh, kids don't hit anymore. It drives me absolutely bananas. <laughs> I don't know what that. happened, man. This whole like hitting's like out of the game now. It's like yesterday, I charged ten dollars for the day of watching hockey. I said I'll pay, but I want to see a hit. Well, you know, Jeff got down on the ice. He wasn't happy. Oh, Jeff, it's not like when we used to play, and it used to be there was little Scott Stevens running around the ice. Right now, it's. You, Oh, Two that's how you got the boys teams. fired up, especially if you're playing like a St. Paul's team. You know what I mean? That's the public school boys would just go running through the boards. That's how you that's how you handle business now. I remember those like, Kelvin St. Paul's games. It's pond hockey. You, it's crazy. Are you it's saying like, the private school kids are soft? Is that is that what you're saying? 
No, but it's your chance to hit him. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, St. Paul's was definitely not soft. They were always dominant in football. No, yeah, always, always a really, and still are a good team. I mean, I have my own feelings about a private school being in a public uh, Winnipeg High School hockey league, but uh, you know, we can we, we can tackle that another day. I'm sure that they're not recruiting players at all. That definitely doesn't happen as my eyes roll back in my head and things of that nature. I'm well, sure it's just, it's all about catchment areas, right? I mean, right, right, take all right. the rich kids and put them <laughs> across the city and then start a hockey team and, you know, and it, well, every other school needs to, uh, you know, work with their own communities and whatever. It's a little bit of a uh, imbalance, let's just say. There you go. It's uh, That is uh, certainly the case. Another topic for another date and Absolutely. time. Uh, Jeff, obviously, uh, a huge Jets weekend. Fault. I see the comments. Jets' fault. <laughs> <laughs> a, a huge, a huge weekend in store for the Winnipeg Jets. They, they, as we talked, uh, touched on in the first segment, they get a reprieve in that Calgary loses to Anaheim, uh, Nashville loses to Arizona. From what you've seen of the Jets this week, you know, with Monday's game against San Jose, obviously disappointing result. Wednesday's game against Minnesota, disappointing result. Do you get the impression that they're maybe, maybe on the verge of sort of breaking through the doldrums that they've been facing over the last couple months? Or do you think that this is just sort of the what to expect from the Jets moving forward? Uh, like a bit of both. Like, I mean, to me, it's, you all, I mean, certainly it's been a step in the right direction, maybe, but I don't know exactly like, on the brink of what, like getting a victory, <laughs> you, know I mean? yeah. you know, like it's <laughs> not on the brink of being a dominating team. Like, I mean, they lost to the San Jose Sharks, who the next night, I think, put one of the statistically worst efforts in a hockey game. Granted, it was on the back end of, you know, a back to back. So that's got to play a part of it. But San Jose was absolutely horrendous the next day. And and the Minnesota Wild played the night before. I mean, there's all and 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 now we head into this this road trip, which is an incredibly important road trip, just to get back on track, in my opinion. Like get some wins. I think you guys have touched on it before. Get some good feelings in the locker room. Um, and maybe see some results. I mean, that certainly has been the case. I mean, you can't look at that Minnesota game and say the Jets played horribly. I mean, they they peppered their goaltender with uh, they they peppered the uh, opponent's goaltender with a ton of shots and and you know garnered a ton of opportunities. But there's just absolutely no finish on this team. And you guys were talking about some of the goal droughts. Mm -hmm. Kind of, I went on there. Uh, I went on to NHL.com as uh, as as you was suggesting earlier in the show. Um, <laughs> it's a hell of a resource. Out, check out some of these stats. Kyle Connor, one goal in eight games. Mark Shifley, two goals in eight games. Nikolai Ehlers, one goal in his last 18. Pierre-Luc Dubois, now I granted he's out right now, but one goal in his last seven. Blake Wheeler, one goal in his last 12. I mean, to me, it's just at one point, do you not get goalied? You know, like this whole, like, it just is, is there a team that gets goalied more than the Winnipeg Jets? And I just, for some reason, cannot buy the fact that James Reimer can goalie. So I just, to me, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's got to be frustrating. It's certainly frustrating in the locker room. I think you have to say some of the things they've been saying after the games with staying in it, but you know, there's frustration brewing. And, and the reality is, is you don't really have time to feel sorry for yourself. This is a, this is a stretch run right here. You're, you, you need to take some solace in the fact that the teams that are chasing you are, you know, are dropping games like Calgary did against Anaheim. I mean, I don't think, I mean, if you look at it, it's Calgary and Nashville. And I know a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of people are saying, Oh, look at Nashville coming, but wouldn't that be a story? A team that was a seller at deadline all of a sudden rises up and beats the, you know, beats the jets out of a playoff spot. So I do think the jets have a lot in their favor right now. They just need to get back to putting in together solid efforts, whether, you know, and results matter. Of course they matter, especially right now. But if you took any positives from the last couple of games, it's at least the structure has been there, right? They haven't abandoned things as much as we saw in the previous 10 games or so, where it was, you know, where it was a lot of what we heard earlier in the season, right? Where when things went bad or things weren't going, you know, as well as they'd hope, guys kind of do their own individual things. I think that was creeping into their game for sure prior to these last two games. But it's, you know, this is what, I mean, if you look at it, they come back, they have these three games here. They come back for one game against Boston. Then they're gone for two games and they come back mm -hmm. for one more, I think. Then they're gone for three more. Um, this is a big stretch here, particularly on the road. And this team needs to find its game sooner and later because there's no, like as much as there is time right now, you have to factor in that you're going to get goalied every once in a while. You're going to have efforts that aren't great. You're going to, you know, you're going to have to face a Carolina hurricanes team at the end of a three game road trip. Like you're not going to be, 
banking all these games. There's there's certainly some runway here, but the Jets need to start taking off and getting back to a game that they can they can follow and appreciate and identify them with. Because at this point in, in the season, I mean, this team doesn't have an identity, or if it does, someone let me know because I don't think we've seen it for the last two months. Uh, Jeff, the 150 residents of Morowina, Manitoba are going to be writing you letters <laughs> yeah. to the Winnipeg Free Press <laughs> complaining about your lack of faith in James Reimer. I got nothing but respect for James Reimer. I think he's a great guy, but it's just like it's one thing to be goalied by UC Soros. It's another thing to be goalied by a James Reimer who hadn't won in Winnipeg since 2013 and was, you know, I know oh. he was he was complaining about not getting dealt or getting an opportunity at the deadline. I'm pretty sure at that time and still right now he's got a sub 900 save percentage. So I don't know. Like, it's just, it, it becomes one of those things where you make your own luck uh, and the Jets just certainly haven't been able to do that of late. No, you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a big difference between a Vesna finalist or Vesna winner. And even though we all love a good Manitoba boy and Reimers had a great NHL career, I, I'm with you, Jeff. Okay. We got to talk about the power play. We've already touched on it. It's like every single Jets fan is is talking about it now, right now. And we don't have to, you know, get into the whole Ehlers thing and and everything like that, because I think most of us agree that, you know, we like to see Ehlers producing on the power play out on the first unit. But I guess uh, aside from, you know, the cliches that we hear, you know, time and time again, Jeff, like what really is like, let me rephrase this. How how important is it for the Jets power play to get cooking tonight? Because there, I think you'd agree, even without Pierre-Luc Dubois, there's way too much talent for the Jets to be going, you know, 0 for 9 on the power play. Yeah, imperative. I mean, especially, you know, if, if you're not scoring goals five on five, you better be putting them in on the power play. And that really was one of the ingredients earlier in the season during the Jets' success, you know, coupled with obviously Connor Hellebuck's play in net that was allowing them to get by with very few and far between five on five goals. This is this kind of was a bit of a power play team earlier on in the year. And that's just kind of run off. And, it, you know, you mentioned about the, you know, you mentioned about Nikolai Ehlers. Look, I'm not going to come out and say this is guy should be on this this power play and this personnel. I've never really been one of those, you know, scribes that goes, you know, thinks that this guy should be on this probably, you know. And it's not that I just necessarily. So that, obviously that was a shot at Mike. Jeff. No, no, no. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but like, but like, it's just one of those things where you have so much talent on this team, but it's almost like they like it's almost too individual on the power play. Like we keep talking about you know, setting up one guy or like, you know, Nikolai Ehlers and Mark Shifley can't be in the same spot. Like, what does that even mean? Like, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't have your best players on, on a power play. Like I know both of them want to be the trigger man there, but both have very different styles in which they, you know, they release the puck. Mark Shifley's a one-timer, whereas, whereas Nikolai Ehlers likes to drive the net with the, with the puck. And so anyways, that's a lot of topic, but I think it comes down to, I think you guys touched on it was just not moving your feet. You look at some of the best power plays in the league, they're they're almost cycling in, in in the offensive zone. They're moving. They're 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 picking holes. Uh, you know, in the in the opposing team's penalty mm. kill by making them move, making them guess. That's when you're moving your feet and you're constantly in, in motion. You're you're making the other team. You're making the penalty kill unit guess what you're going to do. You become way less predictable. And the Winnipeg Jets are just like, I don't know if it's just a greater. Um, I don't know, a, great, a greater understanding of who this team is, but it's almost like they're waiting for things to happen. It's like they, like they, it's almost like they think that they're skilled enough where they just expect something to, you know, to happen. And no one's, no one's really working hard on puck battles. The puck movement is, 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 you know, is much to be desired. And, and, and then the reality is about the power play guys is you start scoring goals. You feel good about your power play. It's almost like they just, you know, you talk about comp scoring in bunches, the power play is pretty much is the epitome of that where it's like, it's like when 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 things are riding high, it's you just feel invincible when you go out. Like the Oilers, right? Like the Oilers power play is the most invincible thing there is right now. Well, that's it. And so, like you pop over the boards, you're feeling really good. It's almost inevitable that you're going to score. With this team, it, it, sorry, it works the opposite. And with this team, we're seeing exactly that. Where the Jets, I think there's a massive lack of confidence when they pop over the boards for the power play, and it's just like, well, is this going to be the time where we break through? And um, it really does. It really does. Uh, it really does provide momentum in a game when you can score and it takes away a lot of that momentum and you can see guys body language particularly after power plays whether they're going off at you know the minute mark or 90 seconds you get a lot of guys smashing their sticks you know a lot of bad body language for a team that should be scoring a lot more on the power play and just aren't and, and really when you have all the issues the Jets have right now when you're not able to score um, you know with, with an extra man up and you're going games and games without that help it's going to be tough to win games especially when your goaltender in Connor Halbach isn't, isn't really playing at the top of his game right now 
Jeff Hamilton, our guest Saturday morning. You're watching the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. We're live on YouTube. We're live on all of our social media platforms. Later tonight, the Illegal Curve post game show uh, after the Jets and the Florida Panthers around 8:45 or so. You know, Jeff uh, Rick Bonus likes to talk about accountability, and nobody's above the law, and he's not afraid. And you, we saw Nate Schmidt come out of the lineup, and he said that didn't come out of nowhere. He had been talking to Nate Schmidt, and he understood that he needed to be better. And as a result, they pulled him out of the lineup. Think you wonder if he's been watching Neil Pionk's game of late, given that sort of uh, tone. But the one I'm curious about, and I want to know your thoughts, Dylan Sandberg coming into the lineup. Because Dylan Sandberg, by all metrics, has been fantastic for this Winnipeg Jets team. You know, almost second pair, second bearing, basically, in my estimation. And so I find it curious that Dylan Sandberg is the guy who comes out. And, of course, Logan Stanley scores that goal. So everybody focuses on that goal that he scored. And then he also may have killed Kirill Kaprizov. Uh, Wild fans think so, at least. But the Yokozuna but, splash. Yeah, but you know, the, the, I, I'm curious. What do you think about in terms of the the decision to kind of rotate the young guys when a guy like Sandberg hasn't done anything to really come out of, do, to merit coming out of the lineup? All he's done is deserve to be kept in it. Well, I think you're looking at the uh, the politics of the National Hockey League in play here, guys. I think there's a certain expectation as a veteran, and um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of fans would look at say you know, Neil PR can be like, couldn't he sit down for a game or two or whatever? Mm-hmm. Well, when you're that, when you're, when you're getting paid that much money and you're, you know, you're relied on, there's a ripple effect in the locker room. And I, and I look at, I look at the sit, I look at sitting Nate Schmidt as the, almost the cop out of, of sitting player, because you knew Nate Schmidt was going to handle it like a pro. I mean, this is, you know, this guy is an undrafted player. He's always enjoyed every moment he's had in the NHL. He's never taken it for granted. Mm-hmm. He wasn't going to, you knew if he was going to be sitting out, especially with, you know, as Rick Bonus mentioned, the conversations leading up to it, um, you know, and, and that it wasn't a big surprise and that that's really when things get iffy is when, when the player's shocked and if they're shocked, they haven't had those conversations. Well, Bonus has said over and over that they had those conversations. So especially when you consider that, I think you knew Nate Schmidt was going to take it on the chin. He was going to smile. He was going to cheer for his teammates and enjoy it because he was going to get back in the lineup. Now, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where it sent a little bit of a message. You know, I, at least guys were saying the right things after the game and and whatever. And it led to, you know, it led to Nate Schmidt scoring the next game. And, and you know, so but but to your point, your question about Dylan Sandberg and rotating the younger guys out, I just think that's the hierarchy of this team right now. And uh, unless you're willing, unless you're willing to make a big splash and take out like a Neil Pionk, uh, you know, or Brendan Dillon, um, like who else would you take out? I'd argue that every other guy outside of Nate Schmidt would have been a bit of a more shocker, maybe less so Brendan Dillon. But even then, you know, I, I think that would have been, you know, maybe an eyebrow raiser. Whereas, you know, with Nate Schmidt, I, I, I think it was more, more to do with a reminder to him that, you know, when you're playing your best game, you're playing with speed, you're joining the rush. Like when the defense were being activated on this club, Nate Schmidt was part of that group. He was often, I don't want to say first in on the four check, but there were several occasions where he, where he would. Um, and, and I think that that kind of left his game. And so uh, to me, it's just, you know, that it could, you could use that as maintenance at this point. I mean, mm-hmm. at the, you know, like I think you could sit out a Neil Pionk and don't have to say this was a message or I'm saying this, you know, it's like, we got a lot of D men. We played a lot of hockey here, maybe just an opportunity for someone to, you know, reset or whatever. And so, uh, but again, I just think that's the hierarchy here. Maybe there was a little bit of trying to showcase Logan Stanley before, the trade deadline, as we know, you know, we requested a trade. Um, maybe there's a bit of an opportunity there. And really, I mean, Logan Stanley with his two injuries, Rick Bonus hadn't seen anything with them. You know, this is this is now this is in January, right? We're now a couple months down the road here. So it's not like he hasn't been back in the lineup for some time. Um, but it's just that's a, that's essentially what they're doing here. And and Dylan Sandberg, I got no issues, you know, <laughs> issues about his usage because he's gonna be a big part of this team. I think when it comes to the playoffs, he's going to be that he's going to be in the lineup every night. I don't, you know, I don't think they're going to, you know, it's going to be an injury based thing. I think they're going to be riding this uh, top six that includes Dylan Sandberg. Um, another guy too, Kyle Copabianco, man. I mean, he's not, uh, he's played well when he's, when he's been in the lineup and you wonder, you know, for, for him going in for Nate Schmidt and then scoring that game, if he, if he doesn't fall ill the next day, mm-hmm. is that two games? Because that would be more of a message in my opinion if you sat Nate Schmidt out a couple games than just than just one singular. And, you know, Rick Bonus wouldn't really play his hand or wouldn't say one way or the other if he would have played, uh, you know, Kovabianko over Schmidt uh, had he not fallen ill. But 
Um, at this point in time, I don't want to say it's a good problem because the Jets could have used upgrades on their D-men, you know. Mm-hmm. And so as as well as Sandberg has played, I mean, um, and and other you know other players have played. I mean, this team needed an improvement, I think, to to compete in the playoffs here, and, and they'll have to do with what they have. So whether whether it's kind of you know swapping in and out the younger guys uh, in the bottom six. I mean, unless you're willing to take out a Dylan DeMello who's playing top line minutes with Josh Morrissey, like I just I don't know who I don't really know who's next in line. Jeff, you you mentioned Logan Stanley and his trade request. You spoke with him this week about it, and you know naturally he didn't necessarily confirm or deny. Hammer's asking the hardest hitting questions, Drew. Well, I mean that's what we expect from Jeff. Logan what, Stanley, what? for the record, Drew was wearing an "I love Winnipeg" T-shirt when Jeff asked him that question. <laughs> Winnipeg is good. He got it from yeah. his buddy Line. Yeah. Exactly. What, what was your sort of you know in in talking with him? What was your impression of the conversation? Look, you know what? I think it's when you hear those kind of reports or those rumors, you immediately think that they hate Winnipeg, that this is not, you know, they want out. This is, you know, like they like it's it's interesting how quickly requesting a trade turns into demanding a trade. And sure. and and I don't think that was the case with Logan Stanley. I think Logan Stanley is a former first round pick. And I mean, there's certainly, you know, there's certainly um, you know, a lot of fans who took that news and was just like, oh, that's what it's going to take to get rid of him because a lot of people are, are, are clearly low on Logan Stanley. He hasn't panned out as the first round draft pick that, you know, many people maybe imagined he would be. And, you know, his height gets tossed in there. He's, oh, he's 6'7", but he's a lousy D-man. Well, he scored a goal, um, you know, when he got back into the lineup and, 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 and certainly helped in that game. But um, I just – I took it more as opportunity. This is a business. And if you're – like, I think it's very, very evident at this point that he is the seventh or eighth defenseman on this team. I mean, sure. for a spell there, uh, you know, Dylan Sandberg's clearly ahead of him. And so when you're trying to make your way – and when you're looking, you're looking at your team's roster and you're looking at the contract statuses of the blue line – you're not going to get paid if you're playing 25 games a year. You know, I mean, obviously he's got back-to-back injuries there that that, that would play into his game totals, but I think he's just looking for opportunity. And, you know, we've heard about this before, you know, Brendan Dillon apparently said he would be good to leave at the trade deadline last year. You know what I mean? Maybe it's as simple as that, that it's not so much, you know, get me out of here. I want to leave, but if my name is, you know, almost kind of doing your, almost doing the bit of your due diligence to your general manager and saying, Hey, if somebody's calling about me and wants me to be on their team, I'm okay to leave. And, and, and that's, that sometimes is, you know, welcome from a uh, welcome from a general manager's perspective. Clearly they did not find a deal that they, that they thought warranted trading Logan Stanley and preferred for him to be on the lineup. And so I thought he handled it well. I mean, you never want to have those things, you know, be made public because people, you know, you need to address them and be asked about it. And so I, you know, we asked him about it and then asked him to just kind of, you know, clear up some of the gray area here. Right. And, and whether you believe he's, whether you believe him or not, I'd believe him when he says he likes Winnipeg, that the organization has been good to him and his family. I mean, I can point to several examples. They sent him home early over Christmas. He got to spend a bunch of time at home a couple of weeks uh, early. That was a big, he, he really appreciated that from the team. I mean, the team's worked with him through his rehab. So I think, again, I just I think it just points to less about a player being unhappy. I mean, clearly he's unhappy with his circumstance from a playing perspective, but I don't think he's unhappy here in Winnipeg with the team, with the coaching staff, with the guys. It's just if you're if you're looking at your own individual um, situation and and looking down the road and trying to sign a, a contract for as much money as possible, you need to play. And, you know, in Logan Stanley's case, for how young he is, that might be more valuable on a team that's kind of making its, you know, going through a rebuild where he can log consistent ice time rather than a team that's on the premises premises of, of making the playoffs and is clearly, you know, not in the top six for the team's plans. I think you make some really good points, Hammer, because there's a big difference between Stanley's name, you know, being discussed by Chevy in a in a possible trade. Because the Andy Strickland tweet was, I'm hearing that Logan Stanley has requested a trade, right? So as you know, I mean, that you have to take that at face value, right? First mm-hmm. off, that's not confirmed. Um, it's possible that, you know, Stanley through his agent did request a trade. I have no idea. He's obviously, as you mentioned, he's not going to tell us. Yes. Oh, there's no doubt. Trade. There's no right? doubt he, yeah. he, requested he requested a trade. A trade. There's no doubt. Right. I mean, there's right. no but, doubt. But uh, the, the point is that he responded well to it, right? Like he scored a goal. So And, and he's, he's saying the right things and he's handling it well. So I, I admire that about Stanley. And we'll see if he gets traded in the offseason. We know he's not going to be traded before the playoffs right so I wanted to ask you about Morgan Barron because you know I got to give Dave credit like he's been a fan of Barron's game since they acquired him 
from the Rangers. And he obviously had the big game, the, the two point game against the Oilers. Um, but he struggled, right? Like, I don't know how many games it was. I think it was like 11 or 12 games before that with no goals. But I guess how important is it for a guy like that to produce on this upcoming three game road trip and for the remaining 17 games of the season? Because I continuously watch Barron and he's great on the PK and he's a good defensive forward. But ask Dave, I keep saying, like, he seems like a guy who's getting so close to breaking out offensively. Oh, big time. I mean, how many grade A opportunities do you have to get and not score? I mean, this guy is doing his best James Wright impression right now where he's getting a lot of opportunities in and around the crease and not putting the puck in. Morgan Barrett has that offensive upside. I think that was, you know, when 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 he when he came over in the trade last year, a lot of the talk was, okay, this guy, you know, he 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 plays a hard game, right? He plays that 200-foot game. He's the kind of player that appreciates every moment in the NHL and knows it can be taken away from him at any point, right? And he needs to continue to make a name for himself. Um, he always had that offensive upside, but no one really knew what exact or knew how, you know, how offensive, how offensively gifted he was or how productive he could be at this level. I, I think I think you have to take some promise in the fact that he's generating such quality opportunities. Him and and Adam Lowry at, at you know. Um, have both been on the receiving end of some great A opportunities, but you got to finish. I mean, th- I think that that really is the difference in a lot of cases of of being a bottom six versus a top six forward. And uh, you know, Morgan Barron's had a lot of opportunity here. Um, you know, especially with injuries, he's he's been given that opportunity on that third line, and we've seen guys like Brandon Tanev and Andrew Kopp. We've seen them blossom in that role and and grow. So it'll be interesting to see what he can do with that. Um, but yeah, I think it's important certainly important for him to to get one just for his own confidence right i mean he's you know he i i think he's a pretty confident guy but you know he's not he's not mark shifley you know what i mean he's not kyle connor like it's not one of those things where you know it's going to come and i think it's it's weighing on him a little bit but but he's been you know i think for for his game it's less about you know of course you want depth scoring right especially if you're not getting power play goals especially if you're not getting scoring from your primary score and i would argue primary scoring is obviously much more important um but depth scoring is certainly um an ingredient for any team that wants to make a long run in the playoffs and um but he's also generating stuff like he's playing a hard game like if you want if if, if everybody played the the way that morgan Barron is playing right now the top six play, they'd be getting goals because they'd be getting the dirty goals they'd be getting the you know the the um, they'd be driving the net like that. He does everything that Rick bonus wants his top six to do because his top six are more offensively gifted. So as important as it is for Morgan Barron to get things going and certainly the bottom six, um, I think a lot of guys could take a, you know, to, could take some, something from Morgan Barron's game and his 200 foot, um, you know, responsibilities out there. And, and again, if everyone played like that, I think this team would be in a pretty good fight. And, and really, I think a guy like Morgan Barron epitomized earlier on in the season when there were a bunch of injuries, when they were carving out wins, I think you had a bunch of guys playing like that. And then when all this talent comes on, on to play, it's like these guys look up and down the bench and be like, who's going to do it. No one's looking, you know, at taking over a game. It's like, where, where do we get this help? And anyway, it's a little off topic for Morgan Barron, but I, I certainly think it's coming for him. Um, we'll just see if, uh, we'll see if it, if it does. Uh, and Jeff, I thought, uh, Blake Wheeler's comments last yesterday in Florida to Mike and, and Kenny and, uh, were curious, right. Talking about how the jets were having more success when they had, quote yeah. they, he didn't, this is not a quote from him, but lesser players essentially, and, uh, played a little, probably a more grittier game, but you know, Jeff, I want to get to the idea of, um, Kevin Sheveldayoff off and, and his sort of role stewarding this, this organization, because, you know, it's not, we're not that removed from the trade deadline just eight days ago and, and the kind of trade deadline presser that he held, which was a bit of a acrimonious affair uh, at times with the Jets GM. And I thought, you know, Darren Dreger, I don't know if you saw his comments on overdrive a couple of days ago, but uh, oh, yeah. he talked. What, what pandering was going on in that one? Well, the point, <laughs> the point is, but where is he getting those comments? I mean, we know where he, those comments are coming from, right? Those comments are coming directly from the Jets brain trust. And so the reality is I just thought, I, and again, like I said, I don't know if you saw them, but it was just, he talked about the state of the organization and what's going to happen with Dubois and Shifley and Hellebuck and, and, and how this team is going to be constructed over the next few years. Do you think that Kevin Sheveldayoff is gonna is likely to remain in this role given the fact that he's already had 12 years and uh, you know these are major decisions coming for this Jets club and obviously it's hard for me to ask you that question given we don't know how this end this season is gonna end but if it continues to progress the way it has or maybe regress you know it's a it's a it's an interesting and, and great question my 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 guess is no um, 
I just, I just don't know how you look. I mean, this was an op. It took what 12 years to build this, you build around this core. This is doubling down on this core. You know, we, we know how involved, um, we know how involved Mark Chipman is with this team and, and decision making. And, and while I don't have, you know, this is just my belief and my thoughts is like, I think he got a, a bit of a muzzle this trade deadline. I think they realized that, look, we're not going all in on this group. This isn't a good enough group to win. Let's just see what they can do um, and see how far they can go. If they can get a playoff game or two, the revenue is super important. We want, you know, the Jets certainly want to get the whiteout parties going, but I don't know if they're, if they're, I don't know how you can be on the same line, you know, that they used to be on. Like, I don't think they're as aligned as they might have been, I, you know, and, and what, what would give you the confidence of a rebuild with Kevin Shovel Day off? You know, like, like if you were to sell off all these, unless, you know, you probably, I mean, this is going to be a massive summer. So do you like, do you, do you give Shovel Day off the keys to, to trade and negotiate and get rid of this core and bring, bring in players on the fly because that's the only way I see it. Look, he's under contract for a couple more years. They might leave it in his hands to do a retool, to do a quick retool on the fly. Like if they can get players for a Mark Shifley or a Pierre-Luc Dubois or a Connor Hellebuck, um, and they can somehow tread water, if you will, and then maybe, you know, grow and become that bubble team playoff team again, maybe open this window up a little bit more. Um, Maybe he's six round, but I don't know how you give a guy who's been in the, the, the GM chair for 12 years a whole rebuild. And, and you know, there's lots of things here. I mean, we talk, you know, I mean, um, Elliot, Elliot Friedman said that, that Kevin Sheveldayoff's job is, the, is one of the toughest, if not the toughest job in the, in, the, in the National Hockey League. And while I'm sure it's tough, find someone who can do it then. You know what I mean? I think that's the issue here is I, I wonder, you know, I wonder – you know, whether it's so how is this team going to be built, right? It, it, it's draft and develop. I mean, that this team probably more than any other team in the National Hockey League needs to have its pick, needs to have players come up and hit. You know, we've seen some trades in the past, but, you know, how how great of a trade partner is is, is Kevin Shovel off, right? I mean, he doesn't like to lose. He doesn't like to lose trades. And I wonder, you know, what teams, what his reputation is in the league for, for you know, dealing with, with, you know, or, or making trades with teams. You see a lot of teams, a lot of GMs make deals with each other, you know, over, over time. And we just don't see that with, with Kevin Shovel day off. So what has he done? I mean, that, that really is the question here, right? Is what has he done to, you know, put trust, um, you know, in the fan base or, or any, or, 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 or in the, you know, in the Jets leadership to suggest that he's going to be able to get this, this club out of it. And, you know, I mean, to me, it's it's um, unless unless they can kind of hit, unless they can hit lightning in a bottle here and do something special in this in this playoffs. I mean, you have to think his if 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 his days aren't numbered, then his seat is certainly is certainly hot. But at the same time, here's the other thing, guys. We know how loyal this organization is. So maybe maybe he is untouchable. I mean, you had Mark Chipman who was emotional, you know, when 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 Paul Maurice quit. You know, like Paul Maurice wasn't going anywhere. Maybe he would have been, you know, maybe he would have been let go or whatever, or, or left the team in the off season prior to this year. But we know how loyal, we know how loyal this organization to a fault. Well, loyal to, some would say, uh, loyal to the wrong people, not loyal to their paying customer, loyal to the people that they employ. And that's not a bad thing necessarily, but at times they also have to be able to sell it to their customer base. And I don't know how you, to your point, Jeff, how you sell more of the status quo if this season continues to go off the rails. You know, they're a, they're a business. And if people don't feel they're getting a value for their dollar, people are going to look elsewhere to spend their entertainment dollar. And that is, I think, something that True North uh, continues to take for granted, maybe less so than they did two or three years ago, but certainly something that they, for the first decade that they were in this, back in Winnipeg, took for granted that people would never say boo, tickety-boo about their product and everything else. I don't see that necessarily as the case anymore. And people demand results. And well, I was going to say, it's a results-based well, business. Yeah, of course And so is. if you look at how long you've been a G GM in this in, for this team, you have yeah. one notable playoff run. It was in 2018, and you got right. bounced in five games to an expansion club in the Western Conference Final. It was a great, exciting run. But what else? you have to show for yourself. I mean, Nothing. there was a preliminary round that you got bounced from. Yeah. You, you were able to sweep, 
you know, Edmonton in that, you know, in that, in that first series in the Canadian division, yeah, then you made lose you no money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's just, it's at what point, I mean, again, I don't know how you justify all those things considered how you justify because a rebuild is going to take years. Right. So if it's a, that's right. That's kind of where I fall on this is that if it's, if it's a rebuild, I can't see it being Kevin Chevalier's job to do it. It just give him like 15, 16 years in this organization. If it's a retool, he might play out the rest of his contract. Well, you know, and just last word before we'll let you get on your your day, Jeff. You know, it's also important to note there's nobody else to take to take the darts that are thrown if Kevin Dayoff is not in the general manager seat. There's no president of hockey operations. Look, Kyle Dubas is there to insulate Brendan Shanahan. He takes the darts, you know, as the general manager of the Leafs, where Shanahan's the president of hockey operations. There's no president of hockey operations in Winnipeg. And, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, do they need another layer between ownership and the general manager? I would argue that they probably do at this point, um, because that's sort of the the unspoken comment is just how involved Mark Chipman actually is in a lot of the decision making uh, on this team like any owner of any business can be. I'm not necessarily leveling that as a negative. It's his money. He can be involved in it. But it's also, I think, goes on. It it, it flies sort of underneath the radar how hands-on a lot of these owners tend to be. Well, and how savvy you are at at being a hockey executive. You know what I mean? I mean, that's that's where it comes down to it. I mean, I do think that, you know, you have to think Kevin Shevelyoff has the savviness as a GM. I mean, he's he's lived his entire life in this game. It's just, it's just, you know, a lot of it too, in my opinion, is drafting the same player. You know, like it, it wasn't really until Rutger McGorry here in this last draft that they decided to draft some power forwards. It was all, you know, and the other thing too is you got to have guts in this league. Like you have yeah, to, you have to have, you have to be willing. Um, you have to be willing to almost lose a trade if, if that makes right. sense, you yeah, know, I mean? sense. To, to fix yeah. your needs. Like you can't just like, you know, the, the, the jets have too many just don't have enough heart, man. And that's a, that's a tough, that's a, you know, that's a, that's an indictment on the team, but like how many guys, like you look at some of the better teams out there. I mean, they're just, there's a lot of heart involved here. And so I don't know if it's, you know, especially after all the rumors too. I mean, not even rumors, man. This room was a mess. It last was. Year. Like, it was an absolute it. disaster. And it's been like that for years. And now we're getting kind of back to that a little bit. Like, this team just needs a new core. I mean, it needs a, you know, I not, you don't have to tear everything down, but this, this team needs to move into a different era mm-hmm. where, you know, they can get a little more autonomy, whether that's Josh Morrissey being your captain, like you got to get rid of some of the, you know, the, the elder statesmen in the locker room. And, and you need to, you need to make this, you know, make this a bit more of a fun team to, uh, I don't know, a bit more exciting team and a team that's like, you know, I think it's massive the way they were playing earlier in the year when it was all about heart, when it was all about cheering each other on and holding each other accountable. And now it's just like, you know, the, the, I don't want to say the smallest amount of adversity, but the first bit of adversity. And we talked about this. I mean, it's all great and fun throughout the first half of the year. It was great cover in this team. Everyone was in a good mood. Everyone was open to, to having conversations, but the question was going to be what happens when this team hits, hits adversity. What happens when they hit a lose an inevitable losing streak because every, it's not going to be rolling for an entire 82 game season. And we got our answer. And the reality is we're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of it. And the reality is, is I don't think they have the horses to get out of it or to handle it. And that's, that's a real problem. If you're trying to win a Stanley cup. Jeff Hamilton is with the Winnipeg Free Press. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us this morning. As always, you're loquacious and opinionated, but we appreciate the insight you bring to the table. One of my That's- favorite parts of Hammer coming on is Drew calling him Jeffrey every time. Because I'm pretty sure <laughs> Huss and Remus never call you Jeffrey. No, not often, but, well, uh, you know. We have a special so relationship. Jeff hates me as a result, but <laughs> yeah. we have a special relationship. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's the other thing. Jeff doesn't, yeah. doesn't well, hate Well, thanks for giving a dummy right. like me a platform to just vent. So, uh, you know, hey. I know there's some people who like it, some people who don't. But it, it, you know what it is? It's I think we're all I think we all looking for a team to get better here. We're looking for a, an exciting run. I, I, I'm certainly hoping for some whiteout parties and some good, some good vibes here in the spring. Let's mm-hmm. just hope the Jets are on board with that plan. There you go. Jeff, thanks for joining us, buddy. Best of luck to your nephew in the high school playoffs. We'll touch base again real soon. Oh, Jeff, they'll be there. They'll just be with the Manitoba Moose. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there you go. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate having me on.
There you go. Jeff Hamilton joining us on the show. Let's head to break. When we come back, much more on the Jets. We talk about the power play struggles. We talk about more about this weekend's games in Florida. Daniel Fink, Manitoba Moose broadcaster at the bottom of the hour. Saturday morning, it's the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. We're live on YouTube and all of our social media platforms. Keeping Winnipeg laughing for over 30 years. Rumors, Canada's longest-running comedy club, bringing you the biggest laughs from the best comedians on the planet. Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, John Stewart, Dennis Miller, Brad Garrett, the greats, and all the up-and-comers, too. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Make it a great night out with friends or book your office or birthday party. Even a fundraising event at Rumors. Get all the details and dates on upcoming shows at RumorsComedyClub.com. Hi, Ez. A strange question for you. But why are you lying on the ground being crushed by a piano? Well, Drew, I definitely tried to carry this baby grand piano down the stairs by myself, and somehow I failed miserably. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. That was a silly question on my part. My apologies. Would you like me to call Rolly's Transfer Moving and Storage to help you move the piano? They are the most experienced piano moving company in Winnipeg, after all. Yes, please call Rollies and hurry. This piano is very, very heavy. Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage offers stress-free residential moving services while taking great care of your personal belongings, including your piano. At Rollies, no job is too big or too small. For more information, visit Rollies.com. Hi, it's Drew from Illegal Curve here. Selling your home can be stressful, but it wasn't for me. Thanks to my friends at Zapia Group Realty, they made the process so easy. My home sold within 48 hours and with multiple offers. Zapia Group Realty took care of everything with their exquisite customer service and attention to detail. If you want to sell your home for more in less time, get started by talking to Frank and Mauro Zapia of Zapia Group Realty. Online at zapiagroup.com. Hey, Drew. Ezzy, whoa, what a smile. Yeah, I got my crowns done at Linden Market Dental Center, and they whitened my teeth. I see. They're so bright that every time I smile, they go, We have hockey tonight. Do you have a mouth guard to protect those pearly whites? I sure do. Whoa, they even ting through the mouth guard. Linden Market Dental Center covers all your dental needs, from restorative to cosmetic dentistry, and will fit you with a sports guard for that active lifestyle. 877 Waverly. See LindenMarketDental.com. So you're a pizza person, you married a wing person, but somehow your kids are salad people. You can't pick your fam, but you can pick your BP meal deal. Starting from $18.99 for takeout or delivery at bostonpizza.com. Big thanks to Jeff Hamilton for joining us this morning on the program, always bringing good opinion and good insight into the Winnipeg Jets. In case you missed any of that interview, the podcast will be available shortly after the show ends. And of course, the immediate replay on YouTube for any of the program that you may have missed so far this morning. As a reminder, the post-game show later tonight, just before 9 o'clock, somewhere between 8.45 and 9 o'clock to talk about the Jets and the Panthers. A huge battle for both teams. The Panthers scratching and clawing in the Eastern Conference race. The Jets, of course, are in the playoff race in the West, but they want to put a little bit more space between them and the Predators and the Calgary Flames in particular. Really interesting Twitter thread that uh, came across my uh, timeline yesterday. I think Dave, you saw it as well. Ezzy, I think you believe. I believe you saw it as well. I'll give credit to the author of the thread, uh, Winnipeg underscore WPG underscore Chief, who uh, I know tweets about the Jets uh, from an analytics point of view. But you know I, what I liked about this thread is that for a dullard like myself. It was pretty understandable. I didn't have to, you know, bring out my my calculator and do too many math. What about Mike Bullard, the old comedian? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where he's gone. I'm not sure if he's still with us or not. But you can Google. You said Bullard, so I just thought of Mike Bullard. No, that's uh, didn't have a show like late night on like CBC or something. I thought Comedy Network, maybe something like that. He like had a. I know, Drew. uh, You're in the comedy business, so that's why I gave you the Mike Bullard. uh, It's a it's a good reference, and certainly. uh, you know, I, 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 I remember the name and I, I understood the reference. So that's a going back in the way back machine there, Ezzy, to bring it up on air. So good job on your part. Uh, but my point is, you know, what, what was interesting about this thread is that it really visualizes and shows how the Jets power play is not uh, operating in an optimal fashion in the sense that the shots that the Jets are generating are coming from worse angles 
which, you know, hockey by and large can be considered a game of angles. If you're shooting from a worse angle, your odds are that your shot is going to go in is less so than if you're shooting from a, from a better angle. I don't think you need to be a math, a math genius to figure that out. And it talking about just how everything's to the outside and worse angles and not as effective just in how it's being established. So a really interesting thread that, you know, from the Jets perspective, you, you look at it and you say, okay, this is the problem. We're not getting enough traffic in front. The traffic is to the side of the goalie. Our shots are coming from a worse angle. It seems like it should be pretty easy to fix, but yet the Jets continue to struggle to, to finally execute it. And it really does show, I thought, just how important Nikolai Ehlers on that first unit was to, tr to uh, the success of that unit. It was a small window of opportunity, but Ehlers' role on the first power play unit, to me, should be a, 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 a must for this team as it goes through the power play struggle. Right. Yeah. And honestly, Drew, sorry, I, I can't talk more about Ehlers being on the first power play, you know, because it's something that, like, what is there to talk about? We all agree. Right. So well, it's, then, it, then why? I mean, okay. Well, I, I don't, I, I you have I to ask you the know Jets the coaches. You have to ask the Jets coaches. I think what I'd like to focus on here, if it's okay, yes. is, is the movement. And the, Ehlers is just one guy on the power play. So yes, Ehlers can score goals on the power play. But I think what you're saying is like, it's the strategy on the power play. There's, there's no doubt that the Jets power play has been struggling. It's been stagnant. And I think, you know, when you look at, you know, who has been brought in, and I think this is important because Pierre-Luc Dubois is a guy who usually plays, you know, in front of the net in that slot area, trying to tip pucks, whether it's, you know, Josh Morrissey shooting the puck or whether it's Kyle Connor, right? So Nino Niederreiter is going to be a huge part of this power play. And I think what you're talking about is simplifying it. And you, you, there's no doubt, guys, that, you know, the puck movement's got to be better. You've got to see more movement. And Nikolai Ehlers is a guy that likes to cycle and uses speed and stick handling. But like, yeah, you got to be, you got to have more of a net front presence. And I think Nino Niederreiter has brought that, but it's not just Niederreiter. It's, it's Shifley. Like you got to stop with the pretty passing, the cross seam passing and, you know, the perimeter play. Like everybody's got to get, go to the net who is supposed to go to the net. So yes, Drew, I'm just, the reason why I'm saying Ehlers is because we're going like how many years guys? Like, it's just, it's tough for me to again, talk about, you know, how Ehlers needs an increased role. Um, because we've already gone over this. It's like we're beating a dead horse here week after week. So th they need to start producing on the power play and they need to get some dirty goals, period. You know, Dave, you, you, we talked, the, the power play, I mean, obviously it struggled on Monday, it struggled on Wednesday, but it, it wasn't even able to really set up I mean, and, and, and I, I know as I understand as his perspective that, you know, we, we, you know, ad nauseum about Ehlers and his usage and everything else, but it, it just seems like when you're struggling to do the basics and you never change up what you're trying to do, no wonder you continue to struggle. It just seems like the Jets are trying to pound uh, a round peg into a square hole here when there's a solution or at least a, another option that seems like historically in small sample sizes, mind you, it leads to success. And yet they seem to, for whatever reason, refuse to do so. Actually, what they're trying to do is pound a round puck into a square net. But yeah, I mean, I think the, I think that applies. More of, Drew a, more and... of a rectangle, actually. <laughs> Well, thanks, Ez, for ruining that one for me. But regardless, I, I think you're right. I think, like, you know, I thought that was an interesting thread, and that's why we talked about it. And, and I think that it shows or it illustrates, like you said, it's it, it's pretty plain, the English and the mathematics. And, and you look at the numbers and you look at where guys are when they're shooting and you look at guys like – and these this is your this is your business. This is what you're supposed to do in the in the NHL and you have like this is Brad Lauer's role and I understand Brad Lauer is is laid up right now and or he was I should say he was back for that Edmonton game in Edmonton he's been back on the bench but he's not back on the ice which is why Eric Dubois remains up with the Winnipeg Jets he's uh he's currently on coaching IR from the Moose but he's up with or, or on recall I should say not on yeah, IR because not, not injured. on IR but he's he's been coaching recall uh, with the Jets, uh, he remains. I don't know. I think he's probably happy to be uh, in Del Boca Vista. The Moose are in Iowa right now, so I'm not so certain how uh, we'll ask Daniel in a little bit how that weather is treating him. But look, I mean, I think that there's no question about it. And I think one of the biggest things, and we've talked about it, the lack of presence in front, the lack of a guy who's like, and that's what that, that thread Drew showed, was that Pierre-Luc Dubois, rather than being in front of the net, has drifted to the side. So yes. he's no longer taking away the eyes. And we, how many times have we talked about this? And like, if you're going to run Adam Lowry on the power play, then there's only one place for Adam Lowry using his six foot, what, four, 
five frames, six or five, I think, frame in front of the net, having no eyes. And that's all you can do. And then you have to adjust. From, if you're Mark Shifley, you have to adjust where you're shooting from. And again, like I said, like you, I, and I credit when fans take the time to do the research, but like, you're, are you going to tell me now an NHL team that it literally employs people to figure this stuff out? Hasn't taken a look at this and hasn't said, Hey, look at this. Let's, let's adjust accordingly because right now this is the way it's working. And what is the definition of insanity? It's attempting, you know, like we're, Oh, let's just keep doing it. Eventually it'll, it'll happen for us. Right. Well, that's great and all, but as, as he said, Oh, and nine is the difference potentially in two more points. And those two more points could be the difference between you being a playoff team or a wild card team and you not being in the playoffs. So you can be cavalier about it and you could have afforded to be cavalier about it in games one to 30 when you were winning, but in games, you know, 60 to 65, now 66 tonight, the Mario Lemieux game, like, sorry, you don't have that luxury anymore. And so now it's time for, it's incumbent on your coaching staff to figure this out because you know, the, the games get tighter. They get, you maybe get a few less penalties. So when you do get them, take advantage of those opportunities and you're not going to take advantage of them as he, by doing the exact same thing and hoping, well, eventually it'll work. Right. And we talked about it. Like they, they play Florida who's in the second game of the back-to-back and they don't have a great penalty kill. I don't know how the penalty kill has been over the last three games, five games, 10 games, whatever. It doesn't even matter. But the point is they're not going up against one of the best penalty kills in the league. And I see some people talking about, you know, Nito Niederreiter playing in the bumper position coming off the boards and, you know, maybe Morgan Barron getting some power play two time. This is all great. There's just too much skill on this team to have as anemic a power play as they do. That's the point that we're trying to make. So, yes, there needs to be more traffic in front of the net. There needs to be more puck movement, more like it also has to be quicker decision making. Like I feel like the Jets, it's almost like now the Jets like settle in for a longer power play. Like they're going to get a couple shots. Like you want it like the good teams, they score within the first 20 to 30 seconds of a power play. Right. So I think that mentality has to be there. Not saying that, you know, the mentality isn't there, but when the Jets power play was really effective, they'd go out there and they'd score earlier in the power play. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like, you know, they're just waiting for, you know, another good opportunity after missing the net. So there's a lot of things here, guys, the faceoffs do matter. When you have an offensive zone face-off, and obviously every time there's a, p- a penalty, you start in the t- other team's zone. So winning more face-offs, that's important too. There's there's a lot of factors here. I mean, Drew is right. It's it's actually, like, I'm actually mad that we're still talking about Ehlers not being on the first power play. It's just ridiculous because he is, I would argue, maybe with the exception of Kyle Connor, he's the most skilled player in a power play situation, right? So he's got to be out there, but... It's the zone the increase the- to me. As, as much yeah. as it is his his ability to 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 shoot the puck and, and 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 you know generate offense and actual goals, which is hugely important. He also is almost you know it, it's a zone entry situation. Once you He's can the zone entry up, machine. That's just it. Once you can set up your power play effectively, you, you know that's the first step. Yeah. The first step to to succeeding on the power play is setting up the power play in the opponent's zone. Mm-hmm. which is something that it does not come easily to the Jets, yet it comes easily to Nikolai Ehlers. So not using him in that role in you know, as, as the catalyst to then succeeding on your power play it just seems like you're making things harder on yourself for no very good reason. I mean, and, and I've heard, oh, well, he wants to play this position or he likes to play this spot on hey, the power if, play. Drew, and if they're scoring, find, him, the find him a position. That's nonsense. That's well, a bunch of excuses for not having him into the Move safely into the middle. The, again, that thread, which I've linked in the, in, the, in the comments, so for anybody that hasn't seen it that wants to check it out, goes back and shows the Jets' power play when it was at its most successful had Shifley in the middle. Shifley wasn't on the one-timer side where right. he's been as of late for the last number of years. He was in the middle, and it was just such a, you. I mean, you think about the goals, you know, that Stasny and Shifley would work together in that mm-hmm. playoff series, in the playoff run. It, it, they, they were in sync, and Shifley wasn't along the, the sidewall. He was in the middle, and you put it on his stick, and it's off his stick before you can blink. I just don't know why. Well, and these positions aren't stagnant. That's the also the point we're trying to make. Just because you're, you know, you happen to be in the bumper position or you're on the point or whatever. Like I've said this before to you guys. Like I like Ehlers on the on the point. Like I realize that you know Morrissey is your number one guy there, and he's the guy that does an excellent job of getting pucks to the net, right? But I mean, just because Morrissey's there to start the power play doesn't mean that him and Ehlers can't switch. Sure. That's the whole thing. Like you look at the Oilers and like there's movement and there's things happening, and yeah, they have Drysital and McDavid. That helps. Um, but I, again, it goes back to what I said, like the jets have way too much skill 
for their power play to be struggling, Dave, at the rate it has been struggling. Yeah, and as the only thing I would add really is is two well, I have two thoughts. Number one, if the Jets were a top five power play, we're not having this conversation. And you can say you can say all you want that the coaching staff is keeping Nikolai Ehlers out for a reason. It's two coaching staffs, but guys, the Jets aren't a top five power play. Like we're not lauding the Jets because their power play is the best power play in the league. And oh, they you know we're just criticizing for the sake of criticizing. The Jets had a good power play. And it's not been good. And the other thing I would point to, and I, I think as he touched on it a little bit, is the timing. This team takes, you know, you, you, why are you slow? Because you're spending 90 seconds on the power play. Why does first power play unit spend 90 seconds on the power play? It makes no sense. Take 45 seconds, take 50 seconds, get off. Then let the other unit get on for 40 seconds. They don't do it, then you can end it off. But the reality is they spend too much time. They sit there, they set up, they spend an hour, not literally, but on the power play, and it's just, it's slow. And I think they, they take too much time on the power play. They're slow on the power play. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the, all Rick Bonus has talked about is speed, playing with speed. Well, use the speed, play effectively, get off. Like, take a quick shift. Don't take 90 seconds. Take, take 45 seconds, get it done quickly, take a breather, get back out there if they don't score. But the reality is that these guys take too long. They're too slow. They're too casual. They don't have the guys who are willing to stand in front of the net, be in the dirty areas get those greasy goals. Well, you know what? Hey, perimeter shooting is perimeter shooting. And right now, look, Kyle Connor is a phenomenal shooter, but it's not working for him right now. He's in a slow stretch. I mean, like I said, that thread showed what right now his, his numbers are. They're not good. Yeah. So, and, and as he, you know, you made a good point guys, if this is a top five power play, you can play, you can say, this is my spot and I'm not moving off of it, but you have gone from a top 10 power play to a top, to a top 20 power play and you're in danger of slipping into the twenties to the thirties. So right now, nobody's spot should be guaranteed. Nobody's spot, maybe with the exception of Josh Morrissey, nobody's spot should be sacrosanct. The reality is you need to do whatever, whatever it takes to adjust things because you're squandering opportunities. These opportunities are points. And ultimately, like I said, when we do the post-mortem on this season, do you really want to say, well, we could have made the playoffs, but you know, we didn't because our power play stunk. Well, well and, and this, sorry, Drew, Drew, just wanted to say one thing. I think we're going to go to break yeah. right away, right? Yeah. But I just wanted to say, like, I think how the rest of this season and specifically this next three games on the road plus the game against Boston, I think ultimately, like, if the power play is going well, most likely the Jets are, are going to be, you know, winning the majority of these games coming up. And the nice thing, I just wanted to mention that mention this, the two most penalized teams in the league, who do you think they are? Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning? Correct. There you go. So the um, Jets are going to get some opportunities. Well, and like you said, the Florida power play or the Florida penalty kill is bottom five in the league. And it has been for the vast majority of the season. And, you know, it's been the case, you know, since the since 2022 became 2023. So it's a struggling penalty kill and a Winnipeg Jets team that struggles to score goals. Absolutely needs to take advantage of that uh, starting tonight to feel better about themselves and maybe finally get into the into the win column, which they've done so sparingly as of late. Uh, some tweets courtesy of our friend Ken Weave. I'm not sure if the Jets are skating this morning. It's an optional. Uh, yeah, starting, it's an optional. It's an optional Kenny starting. was on the golf course, boys. It's, He's not. Yeah. He's uh, talking to Rick Bonus. Here's what Rick Bonus had to say, uh, courtesy of Ken Weeb. Uh, Rick Bonus said he would know more tomorrow about whether or not Pierre Luc Dubois would join the team on Monday in Sa- in Carolina. Uh, the Dubois injury was sustained on a hit from San Jose Sharks defenseman Mario Ferraro on Monday night. Was that Bonus the one that was, happened in the neutral zone? I, I'm guessing. I think maybe that makes sense. Uh, Bonus was asked if Dubois was in concussion protocol. Uh, he would not say. He would only say it's an upper body injury at this time. So uh, why you know, can't you just say whether or not he's in I concussion that, that protocol? Well, I'm not ridiculous. sure why you have to keep that a secret. And also, it, it, if they think if they're going to find out tomorrow if he can join them on Monday, you would have to assume that means does he clear concussion protocol in order to join the team in Carolina on that Monday? That makes me so, think that he is in concussion protocol. By of him course, not. it tells me that he's in concussion yeah. protocol. Otherwise, you know, my T-shirt that says my player is in concussion protocol is asking is generating a lot of questions. Is, Drew, your is, T-shirt is, says oh, Betway. Yeah, I was going to say it's on. It's Betway, Drew. Not Winnipeg well, is. Good. I'd like to thank. And it's actually friends. not a T-shirt. It's a sweater. It is a sweatshirt. It's a crew neck. I'd like to thank our friends at Betway. If you ever need anybody who is an expert on betting the SEC men's uh, college basketball quarterfinals Stock and group. Mac football. Stock. I'm your guy. I went four for four in my parlay last Go night. Go Kentucky. Bro. Yay me. 
I don't know event. if Kentucky was involved in that bet, but go Kentucky. Well, they actually is watching. Well, thank you. I actually wagered against Kentucky. I took Vanderbilt plus wow. the points. Hey, I had Vandy. to bet with my Drew, I Drew's to... always loved Vandy. Well, I only love Vandy because usually Kentucky beats up on them. But in this case, the game mattered to Vandy. It didn't matter as much to Kentucky. So I could feel as though getting eight and a half points was a was a good wager. A true and sign we... of a gambler. A true sign of a gambler and not a fan is Drew Mendel right there. There you go. I bet with my head, not necessarily my heart. David That's Putty. Right. David Putty would be disgusted by you. That's fine. That's got to support the reasonable. team, Drew. I know. I hey, I support the team. There's no question about it. But when there's money to be made, Dave M. There's money to be made. I, I you know, business I got a scratch and claw to get to get the business. cleaning ladies like Ginsburg, who's uh, got them falling from the trees left, right, and center. <laughs> Dave, we or yeah, Drew, Dave yeah, and okay. I don't have anything. We to break. We're we not got, the ones going to hell. We got Finker coming up, so let's uh come on. Let's go. All right. That's Daniel that. Fink, who went from hammer time to Fink o'clock. We have to get his next. intro music queued up, right, Dave? Yeah, we're we're watching the illegal curve hawk. Saturday morning, welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsberg. We are pleased to head to Des Moines, Iowa, where the voice of the Manitoba Moose, Daniel Fink, joins us to talk about the Moose as they're on their road trip playing against the Iowa Wild later tonight. Daniel, good morning. How are you? Doing swell. Just wearing my... Is this a t-shirt too, or... <laughs> Either way, it's all good. Every, who's who's practicing? Is that the moose or the wild is, behind you? That is a live look in at Manitoba Moose Morning Skate here today ahead of tonight's 6 o'clock puck drop against the Iowa Wild. There Dan, you, you maintain your track, track record of always having, always looking handsome, but also always having the best backgrounds. Because Dan, I think 99% of the time when he comes on the IC Hockey Show is always in the rink with hockey behind him. So Dan maintains his status and his, uh, his title. If there's one thing that I can be good at and claim to it. I'm glad it's that. <laughs> <laughs> Dan obviously brought you on to talk to somebody knowledgeable about the Manitoba Moose, as opposed to the dollar that we usually have joining us. I'll uh, go, I'll go are... find someone else. <laughs> the Moose are playing great hockey as of late. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's points in 10 of their last 11 games, which is an impressive streak at any level of hockey. Why the success? You know, this was a team that was sort of, inconsistent i would say up until recently but now that they're getting on this role what do you attribute that success to yeah they were kind of almost consistent in their inconsistency about a 500 club uh, they had a real nice start to the season and then kind of rode that for a little while and honestly coming into the all-star break we're in a bit of a tough spot they'd lost three straight they played pretty well it was one of those stretches where you play the right way you don't get the results they got two points out of six on a road trip and all of a sudden, the Grand Rapids Griffins were nipping at their heels uh, for that final playoff spot. The Moose came out of the out of the uh, All Star break. They won two straight against the Griffins, and then they just haven't stopped since. It's been a very nice run for them. And now, even when you factor in those three losses ahead of the All Star break, they have points in something like 18 of 23 or something like that, or 17 of 22. I'd have to go back and check what the exact number is, but uh, they have just been gobbling up points for the last while and it's let them get right into the mix for the uh, central division crown here and if they'd won that game in abbotsford in overtime they would have been tied in points but technically ahead and owning that top spot in the central division so they're right in the thick of it now and it's been quite the turnaround for the moose Dan, there's so many guys that we can ask you about as i always preface each question and we're going to get into a bunch of them and the guy i ask you about might surprise you maybe it won't and it might surprise you know our viewers and stuff but daniel torgerson is a guy that i obviously don't watch as much moose hockey as you guys do but when i've watched him play he's so impressive and because he's the 2020 second round pick i think maybe i watch him a little bit more closely than some of the other prospects billy hano obviously wouldn't be included in that but you know maybe his numbers wouldn't jump out at you i think he's got six or seven goals but you know according to dave he's been playing a lot with uh henry nickenen and i just wanted to ask you this is his first full season with the moose i just wanted to ask you how you've seen his game develop because i think you'd agree he's a guy that you know the true north organization hopes will be in the nhl a couple years from now yeah i think for both Nikonin and Torgers in very similar paths here with the Moose in mean, first season in North America, like you said, that brings a lot of adjustment, not just on the ice where the ice surface is different, the game is different, but off the ice as well. You have two guys living outside of their home country now and to, on a different continent to boot. That's a big adjustment. And uh, when you're moving into pro hockey, there's so much going on or moving into North American pro hockey. Uh, it, it can be a lot. And we've seen them 
established the building blocks. I think I, I've brought that up, kind of building a foundation for yourself and building throughout the season a couple times on this show. And that's exactly what those two have done. And I think the Leafs are starting to reap the rewards of that. And the second half of the season is always interesting in the American Hockey League because it, in some ways similar to junior, maybe not quite as marked as it can be, young players start to find their way in the league. And it can go a couple of different ways with players maybe getting a little tired because they haven't been through a schedule as grueling as the AHL before, or they start finding their way in the league. They start establishing themselves. And now that they've built out that foundation, they can start to put new layers to their game. And uh, as a result, we're starting to see that, I think, with both Meekinen and Torgerson. And uh, you know what? Like you said, those numbers aren't exactly eye-popping, but uh, they are increasing. And that's what you want to see is that rate of production starting to increase as the season goes on. And for Torgerson, scored a big goal uh, in Abbotsford, his eighth of the season to tie the game in that first game uh, when the Moose were down 2 nothing in the first period. So uh, some good timing, some good play, and uh, you're starting to see those guys come along as prospects. Now in the morning, you're watching the illegal third hockey for the Moose are in Des Moines, Iowa this weekend to face the Wild, wanting to continue their hockey. Well, I'm not sure what's happening with Drew's audio, uh, Dan, but I'll uh, I'll try and get my question going to you. And, you know, one thing that Jets fans have been uh, lamenting is the power play of the organization. One thing Moose fans do not have to lament is that power play because the Moose power play has been top five, top three right now. And uh, their PK, usually in the top five, slipped a little bit, but special teams have been such a benefit to this, to this club. But I want to focus on the power play because the Moose do something that I don't know how many other teams do, and I really just watch the Jets and the Moose, so I can't attest to what other teams do. But, I mean, how unusual is it to watch three defensemen, Leon Gavanke, Declan Chisholm, and Billy Ainola, uh, out on that power play? Is that usually on a five-on-three? We've seen them do it on the four-on-three. But it's, it's just, to me at least, to my eyes, what about from your perspective when you watch a three-defenseman configuration on a power play? Yeah, it's a little different. And the Moose did use it uh, a little bit last season. They got a little bit depleted and the power play wasn't clicking along. So they tossed those guys out there to see what would happen uh, at five on four. This season, it's been more of a specialty uh, specialty drop, if you will, that when they do go to a four on three or a five on three, you might see both or all of Hanel and Gavanka and Susan come over the wall. And it was dynamic in that five on three. Uh, it was a different look for sure. I was talking to Declan about it earlier today, and he said it, it's not really a different feel on the ice. It's just they're the same guy. They're different guys on the power play. They're not really defensemen at that point. They're just members of the power play. But when you have three supremely talented defensemen like that, why not utilize them together when they can move the puck as well as they can? And they're all comfortable, especially across the top of the zone, so they can easily switch locations. It gives that power play a lot of motion and uh, we saw that to full effect in that uh, five on three goal against Abbotsford where it was the puck was slinging through seams. It was moving quickly and then a quick retrieval after a shot and then back up top swinging over and eventually to the back of the net off the stick of Leon Gavanka. So uh, it, it's a lot of fun to watch when they do get zipping the puck around like that. Uh, power play hasn't been as hot for the Moose of late. Uh, they were probably robbed a goal the other night uh, in uh, in Abbotsford, a, a goaltender interference call that uh, probably shouldn't have been levied. Um, but uh, overall, they've been producing at the right moment. And sometimes that's almost as important as having that high percentage. Is a power play that comes through for you at the right moments in games can be just as valuable, even if its percentage isn't as high. Luckily for the Moose, they got both. Dan, uh, Oscari Salmonen's played 31 games. Arvid Holmes played 28. You know, by nature of the AHL with its back-to-backs, you need two goalies, you know, playing relatively consistently. But when it comes down to playoff time or when it comes down to the Moose needing one win on one night, who do you think is the most uh, is the goalie that's got the most trust of the coaching staff? It sounds like a question for some of the guys on the ice behind me. Um, I, I'd, honestly, it's it's really dependent on the night for the Moose. I, I don't think either goaltender has really established themselves as the go-to. And uh, uh, for better or worse, the Moose have really been able to rotate through the two. So uh, they've been consistent between the two of them. The Moose know, for the most part, what they're going to get every night. Arvid Holm had a really nice stretch earlier on in this season where I believe it was six or seven in a row that he allowed two or less goals. Uh, Salmonen's been able to put together a couple of starts and then maybe falter a little bit and then get back to it. So neither's really gone into an extending cold stretch, but by the same token, neither of them has been extremely hot either. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Moose rotate through in the playoffs and just ride whoever's hot. 
Dan, last time we had you on, I think it was uh, mid-November, late November, we asked you about uh, Jansen Harkins. And I, I always talk about Harkins with Dave because, you know, first off, I think, you know, you would agree that, you know, he would be one of the first guys that would be called up to the Jets if they decided to, to go that route. But it's just so impressive to me because of how, how he's producing, right? It seems like every time I'm, I'm on Twitter during a Moose game, um, or listening, of course, on the radio, like I, I see that he's, you know, produced a goal or he's in on the offense, right? So just how impressive has it been that for a play, player who easily could have sulked and, you know, and, and now he's he's providing not only, you know, goals and assists, but leadership on a young Moose team. He's still yeah, young I, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, he's uh, he is extremely productive. I mean, you look what he's got, 32 points, I believe it's 27 games. So right in oh, well over a point per game this season, just set a new career high. It's funny, he had hit 31 points twice in his career. It took him 70 games to do it the first time. It took him 30 games the next time. And then I believe it was 26 games uh, the third time to get to uh, 31. And then a game later, he's at 32. He's got, uh, I believe it's six points in his last three games. So uh, he's been rolling right along. It's interesting because he was really scoring a ton of goals for the Moose kind of the first half. Now he's been more of a distributor. I was talking to Mark Morrison about that before the skates and uh, says he's, he's a guy that just has the puck all the time. And when you have that ability and you have the puck, opportunities are going to come either for yourself or for your teammates. And uh, he's certainly been in the middle of a lot of good things for the Moose this season. And uh, that's really been a, an element. And I think last season they kind of missed that. They didn't have that guy who you could put on the ice and something might happen every time he hits the ice. They were very much uh, a level team, a consistent team all the way through their lineup. But they didn't necessarily have a scorer like a Jansen Harkins or an uh, a Alex Limoges as well. These guys that can just make something happen out of nothing. And uh, that's uh, been really valuable for them. A couple of clutch goals for either of those guys along the way and uh, certainly gives them a leg up on some of their competition. And it uh, really, really does help uh, when you need that big goal at that right moment. You know, Daniel, I got to ask you about Jeff Malott because he's such an integral part of this team. And, he, you know, he, he started, he had a good start to his season, scored a bunch of goals, went through a bit of a, you know, goalless streak there, had a couple of goals in one of the games in Abbotsford. Just how important maybe for folks who don't pay attention to the Moose as much has Jeff Malott been, is Jeff Malott to this team, sorry. Yeah, when you look at Jeff Mallott's season, it was interesting. Yeah, he went on that 10-game run where he was scoring all the goals in the world ever um, leading into Christmas and then came out of Christmas. And as goal scorers can sometimes do, you lose that you lose that feel and it went real cold for him for a little while. I believe he had one goal in 16 games. The interesting part through that sequence is when you start to look at it a little more, all of a sudden the Moose lines got jumbled up a little bit. They were dealing with some injuries. They were dealing with some call-ups. Uh, the top line wasn't really generating, so they started to shuffle things around. I just don't know that Malad ever got the right fit. He never was playing poorly. Um, he was doing all the things that he usually does. He's a very consistent player, but it just wasn't going for him. Then gets reunited with that top line, and while Dominic Toninato and Alex Lamoge were racking up some points, Malad strangely still wasn't. So he was doing all these good things, whether it was net front presence, whether it was battling the puck free, but uh, I think there were a lot of third assists and things like that through there. He had a couple of goals that uh, changed the names uh, after, after the fact. Um, so it was just kind of one of those weird stretches. But you look at what the player was actually doing, and the shots he was generating, the chances he was generating, what he was doing for his teammates. He was still a very highly effective player. And when you have a guy that strong with that skating ability, with that shot, I mean, he's just such... A, handful down below the goal line he really does dominate uh in tight things like that but he scores a lot of his goals in the paint and when you're a scorer like that it can really go cold for you because you need the puck it's somewhat out of your control you can win all the battles in front that you want but if the puck bounces to the right and you're to the left tough luck so uh, for him a lot he gets a couple of those bounces the last time out he tends to score in bunches so we'll see against this Iowa team that he was extremely effective against in this building leading into Christmas, if maybe he gets going a little more here, but he's certainly starting to pick up the offensive count a little bit. Last one for you, Dan, you're at the AHL level. You're used to players getting called up and moving back and forth from the NHL to the AHL, to potentially the ECHL. The Moose are in a unique position as Dave has touched on before that they've had a coach called up. Eric Dubois obviously moved up uh, to be uh, behind the bench for the Jets as they're going through a, a, an injury on their coaching staff. How has Mark Morrison sort of pivoted the responsibilities of his coaching staff minus a guy that he expected to be with him for most of the season, of course. 
it's kind of interesting. It's second straight season that the Moose have had a coach called up. Marty Johnson went up for a few games last season, and obviously that audition went well for him uh, <laughs> now with the Winnipeg Jets. But, uh, yeah, this has been a, a long stay for Eric Dubois with the, with the Jets. I got to talk to him last week, and uh, he's really enjoying the opportunity. Uh, he's definitely keeping tabs on everything Moose. He was at one of the games, uh, just poked his head in, I think, after a couple of meetings to, to keep tabs on the team. But, uh, you know what, uh, it's a great opportunity for Eric, and I uh, hope he's still enjoying himself with uh, with the big club and uh for the moose i mean they've uh, they've kind of made their way through it drew mcintyre the uh developmental goaltending coach spent some time down on the bench and then he had to leave to go handle some of his scouting duties and things like that and now he's back with the team here in iowa so i'm guessing he will slide down to the bench uh again uh and that's been an interesting experience for mcintyre he's never been on the bench uh, in a pro setting obviously uh, relatively recently retired from his playing career he'd done some coaching uh, at like at minor uh, minor hockey levels and things like that but uh, he's really relishing the experience of being on the bench with the moose it, it gives him a different perspective usually he's up in the press box gets to see his goaltenders at work from a different angle gets to talk with some of the players about more systems related things which as a goaltender isn't necessarily his strong suit so he's working to build on that and so it's uh, it's been a good opportunity for multiple people in the organization despite of course uh of course wanting uh, brad lauer to be back to exactly what he was doing with the jets and having everybody in their regular roles but uh just like for the players when <laughs> things go awry it breeds opportunity although there daniel D- oh, daniel it's not quite true because i did say mark morrison jokingly said when we asked what it was like having drew mcintyre on the on the on the bench with him he goes I'll, I'll prefer Eric. And then he walked away with a smile. And then right after that, all the dip moves did was went on a winning streak. It didn't lose a game again in regulation for, for some time. So I, I haven't had a chance to ask Mark if he wants to revisit those comments. But I just quickly before, I know Drew said last question, but I'm going to sneak one in here under the wire. No, no, you're done. I'm gone. That's it. Yeah. This, it, no. is up. this yeah, is like, going to cost you extra, Dave. All right. All right. All right. I'll have to, all right, ask, I'll have to ask an extra good question in, uh, in, in my post game the next time the moose are back, which won't be for a while. But, no, I, I just wanted to ask you about – you're with the team a lot, and I wanted to ask about the feeling because, you know, you're now in that playoff push and you're you're within striking distance of first place like you just touched on. How much is it within the room right now, the feeling of the excitement? Because we all remember what the Canadian division was like. These guys played their hearts out. They had nothing to play their hearts out for. They're, losing the carrot of the playoffs is such a significant thing. That team was exceptional in that they kept playing even though it didn't matter. From this team's perspective, a young team you've touched on when you were on our show, one of the youngest teams in the AHL. How much excitement is there right now as the, the playoff focus, you know, the AHL comes out with their uh, their uh, bracket to show how, you know, your points away from clinching. We know the Wranglers of Calgary clinched yet last night. They were the first team to clinch a playoff spot. So how much excitement is there in the room with this team knowing this is their group and this is the team that they're going to use to fight for a playoff spot? Well, I know in our office, when the first email came in with the AHL playoff primer that Jason (laughs) Shamovich and his staff do an incredible job with, uh, by the way, um, when that hit our inboxes, there was a big cheer because it meant (laughs) it's time. This is this is the push for the playoffs. And you know what? When you're playing meaningful games at this stage in the season, talking to the coaching staff, that's what gets them excited because it's like extending your playoff run, whether or not you do make the playoffs. And obviously that's a whole different level when you're playing these meaningful games that uh, you need to come through with points in it's huge for development. It's high leverage situations. That's exactly what you want for your prospects. And now because the Moose have played so well, not only are they able to play in these meaningful games where last season, things were kind of sorted out. Uh, Something had gone really awry. The Moose might've dropped down from second, but it was going to be what it was going to be for the final about this time of the year things are very much up for grabs right now in the central division like i said earlier the moose are one point back of the texas stars they're tied with the milwaukee admirals those three teams are going to be slugging it out until the bitter end here i think it's going to come right down to that final road trip of the season when the moose are in texas for a couple of games so when you look at all these games that they need to play i think there's a couple things going on. One, they're trying to remain focused on themselves. It's really easy to standings watch and be aware of that. Um, but you can't control what happens between the Texas Stars and the Coachella Valley Firebirds tonight. You can't control what happens between the Tucson Roadrunners and the Milwaukee Admirals. You're certainly happy that Tucson beat Milwaukee last night in regulation, but you can't do anything about that. So all you can do is go out and play your game. I think that's what the Moose are really focused on, but they are having a lot of fun right now. I mean, you even after the loss in Abbotsford, you could have gone down there and, and maybe it would have been uh, dour vibes. Everybody's 
sour. They lost in overtime. Nope, they parked it. They moved on. They're having a good time on the bus heading into Vancouver, getting ready for that flight. Uh, spirits were high. So this is a team that's confident in itself right now, knows what it's about, and they're just having a good time. And those are very powerful things when you look at uh, team success. When, they, when you have a team that still has great vibes and things like that, when things aren't going well, it just adds to it when they are. And the Moose have put themselves in a real nice position, and we'll see if they can take advantage of it this weekend. And Dan, you know, oh, sorry, hold on. I just wanted to say, you know what else is going to be a good time? I can get a plug in for Hockey Manitoba here. Uh, March 26th, uh, which is, I believe, it's either a Saturday or a Sunday, celebrating women in sport. The Jets just did their game. Um, and then, obviously, we're working with the Moose. Uh, and there's going to be uh, female hockey, minor hockey players at the game. And there's going to be, I believe, six that are going to skate out and uh, stand alongside the Moose for the, the national anthem. So I wanted to get in there uh, March 26th, uh, celebrating women in sport, which is a Sunday. Yeah, 2 o'clock, I believe. Yeah, really looking forward to that. I mean, that, that homestand coming up is going to be huge for the Moose overall. But uh, that, that game is a lot of fun. And it, it's not something necessary to see. Uh, in front of the camera or on the ice. But while that's all going on, we'll be having our uh, Women in Sport Job Shadow program as well. Um, and so uh, they'll be cruising around behind the scenes. It's kind of a two-day event. And it's really cool. It was an award-winning program last year. Uh, was awarded uh, most unique community initiative by the American Hockey League. So looking forward to year two of that. I wasn't really able to participate. I was just coming down off of COVID. I was able to get into the building for the, uh, for the game, but uh, we were still kind of, I was still sealing myself off away from people. So I kind of was waving from the other side of the glass, but uh, so I'm looking forward to being a little more involved in that this time around. And uh, it was, it was a real cool program. Uh, looking forward to it again. I think submissions just closed, but if you check out moosehockey.com, uh, if you're still interested in submitting for that, uh, they might still be open here. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to that game. Looking forward to the homestand, but uh, some serious work to get done here on the road before that happens. And Dan, yeah. I'm going to be shadowing you as a play-by-play -play announcer during that game as well, right? Wasn't that the plan? Uh, excellent. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> the pro the promotion has now been cancelled. <laughs> yeah, Dan's like, okay, I'm going to have to call the Winnipeg police now. Per Perry's got Ezzy's picture on the wall. He's like, yeah. Sir Ginsburg, you're out. Yeah, you might have a press always, pass, but you're not allowed to up here anymore. I can always rely on Perry to keep things uh, keep things copacetic, if you will. There you go. Daniel Fink is the Manitoba Moose play-by-play -play broadcaster. The Moose in Iowa this weekend. We'll keep a close tabs on them. And, of course, Dave M. will have the Manuk Moose Minute later on tonight as well. Finker, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Again, we'll do it again real soon. There he goes. Daniel Fink, Moose Broadcaster, joining us this morning on the Illegal Curve Hot. That's going to be a he tough always comes on with the – sorry, go ahead, Dave. No, I was going to say, that's going to be a tough Manuke minute because I'm going to be like Jets, Moose, Jets, Moose. The bo games, both games are at 6 o'clock starts, so my eyes will be split screen, but I'll uh, I'll try and keep everyone in the loop so I can do a Manuke Moose minute. Too bad you don't wear glasses. Then you'd have four eyes. I know, but I only have two. But I'm bum ching. Wow, that was terrible. Just well, terrible. mine was deliberately terrible. Then Manuk ruined it with whatever. I just kicked you out for that. <laughs> no, honestly, that <laughs> you deserve that. You deserve like a two second time out there, Drew. Well, look, it was clearly a dad joke. There's no question. It was a, it, it, it was a dad. Joke. No, it was a bad joke. Well, I mean, it was a bad, you know, dad joke. It was a bad dad. It was a, it was a, bad, bad, it was a bad, bad joke by a dad. Bad dad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, update from South Florida. Uh, sounds no surprise. Connor Hellebuck is going to be the starting goaltender for the Winnipeg Jets tonight. We don't know who, of course, is going to start for the Panthers. Won't know that till later this afternoon as they're not skating on the second half of a back-to-back. -back. Uh, players taking the optional for the Jets, Blake Wheeler, Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, Nino Niederreiter, David Gustafson, uh, to name a few. Uh, Mike McIntyre reports, not sure if something is up with Gustafson who was scheduled to play on the fourth line tonight. So obviously uh, we will find out a little bit more about that. And then a uh, quick note about the lightning, the Tampa Bay lightning tomorrow, they play the Chicago Blackhawks tonight, Brian Elliott getting the start in goal for the lightning tonight, which oh. means the jets are going to see Andre Vasilevsky tomorrow against David Riddick. So Elliott's actually had a decent season for a backup, but yeah, you'd rather play Elliott than, than Vasilevsky. But like we said, tonight, the jets might get Alex Lyon, the Panthers back up, but I look at, I'd have to, you know, do some digging and maybe check out like a guy like George Richards who covers the Panthers or someone else. Yeah. But Bobrovsky didn't face a lot of shots. So maybe Bobrovsky plays against the jets, but regardless, I checked, I checked George's Twitter feed. He didn't, he didn't yeah. say anything. Well, about they just played last night. So regardless of who's in net, I mean, the jets need to win tonight's game, but they could That's get a, a, a bit of a, a break and not have to face uh, Bob. 
Yeah, look, look, it, it, it doesn't matter who the goalie, who the opposition goalie is, as we've seen. Uh, you know, Mark Andre Fleury, Hall of Famer, stoned the Jets on Wednesday. <laughs> James Reimer, solid veteran. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, towards the end of his career, not going to make the Hall of Fame at any point in time. He stoned the Jets on Monday. The Jets Jack Campbell find... stoned the Jets last weekend. Oh, oops, no, he let in seven goals. <laughs> the Jets need to find a way to get goals. It's that simple. Drew, Drew you should be, you should clarify though. I mean, there's a good chance that James Reimer makes the Manitoba Hockey Hall of Fame. So, uh, you said he's not going to make the Hall. Oh, of he'll Fame. definitely make the Manitoba Hockey. That's Hall what I'm Hall saying. So Drew should be careful what he says. Hall of Fame is, is well, what I did mean. So right. yes, thank you for clarifying. And thank Drew's you in the Glendale Hall of Fame for uh, tennis. Yes, I'm really not. I'm not in any halls of fame as of yet. I mean, halls of shame, multiple, <laughs> but uh, halls of fame were still be, is still to be determined uh, on that front. But uh, in any event, the Jets need a hall of fame performance. How's that for? Uh, there we go. Great segue. Good segue. Thank yep. you. The Jets need a hall of fame performance tonight. They got. Uh, a break in the standings. They were sitting in South Florida. Rick Bonus talked about it, saying they were going to be keeping a close eye on the games of the teams that were behind them in the standings. We know that the Predators lost to the Coyotes. We know that the Flames lost to the Ducks. The Jets need to find a way to get a victory. Two points is, is absolutely essential for this Winnipeg Jets team tonight uh, to just you know, feel good about themselves. They got those two points against Edmonton last Saturday, but the good feelings didn't last because they obviously did not uh, follow it up with adequate performances on Monday and Wednesday. It's the start of a new uh, week if you're going by the Illegal Curve Hockey Show calendar. And so the Jets need that performance tonight. We'll bring you all the latest on the Illegal Curve post-game show later tonight, right around uh 8 45 p.m tonight is where we're going to be touching on everything that happened with the jets and the florida panthers drew can i just quickly touch on the comment we had up there from c-mac sure Um, i think c-mac owes me an email and we owe him a toque because he never emailed me so we got to ship you out a tough duck toque c-mac i'm not sure if you uh signed off when when you won the tough duck hardest hitting comment but send me an email and we'll send you toque but it was the comment that i wanted to talk about i think this one is he yeah the hellbuck one I wouldn't be. I almost expect Hellebuck to play both games, and 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 even if you know Hellebuck gets 35, 40 shots, I wouldn't be surprised. These games are that important, boys. And and this is just my opinion. Obviously, Riddick could play tomorrow versus Tampa Bay, but when you consider that Riddick played uh, against the Sharks, yeah. like I wouldn't be surprised if Hellebuck gets both of these games, even if he faces thirty-five plus shots. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that second game. Um, but because of how important these games are, I I, I would not be shocked. And we've already seen Hellebuck play back-to-back games several times this year, right? So, yeah, absolutely, good point, Ezzy. And it's and it's actually he's a player who's had a ton of success in back-to-back games. He actually plays well yeah. in those back-to-back situations. So that's something to keep an eye on in the course of uh, the game flow for tonight. And of course, then we'll touch we'll touch about it on the Illegal Curve post-game show. Dave, last comment to you. A couple of things quickly. Got to give a the, make a note of the fact that the Winnipeg Ice won their 51st game last night, a 5-4 uh, overtime win for them. I believe they're taking on Brandon tomorrow, but they're going for a historic run. They have 51 wins. That last year they had 53 in their history, back dating back to Kootenay and to um, Edmonton, for example. They had never had a 51 season, and that was back when the WHL used to play 72 games. And now I think the best ever they had a 49 win season once in Kootenay, but so they had 53 last year. They picked up the 51st win. I believe they have seven games left. So they're going for a historic run in the Winnipeg ice uh, season. And looks like they're setting themselves up to have a phenomenal uh, first round against the guy who I'm going to mention with the second point, Brad Lambert, the Jets 2022 first rounder. Mm-hmm. He had a goal and two assists last night. He's up to 30 points. I think it's 13 goals, 17 assists since he was assigned to Seattle. And it was an absolutely phenomenal goal. If you haven't seen it, I've got it on my Twitter, but uh, Lambert looks like he's really uh, excelling with the, with the WHL Seattle Thunderbirds. So just a may have... dub minute drew. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I'm just saying it may be, it's kind of a Jets. I'm bringing it back to the Jets, but I'm saying if the ice and the Thunderbirds end up facing off in a final, it might give chan- Jets fans a chance to watch Brad Lambert excel in the WHL. It would be called a Dave Dub diatribe if it was about that rather than True. a new commercial. And, and if I if I can, I'm I'm heading there right after the show ends. I'd like to wish happy birthday, fourth happy birthday to my twin nieces Mila and Addison, my sister's daughters. Hey. They were they were born three months premature, and they were I think like a pound to two pounds when they were born, Oof. and now they're four and and healthy and and beautiful. So happy birthday, Mila and Addison. 
There you go. Yes, happy birthday. birthday to them, undoubtedly. Well, yes. Uh, big thank you to everybody who joined us on this morning's program. We had Jeff Hamilton. We had Daniel Fink, in case you missed either of those interviews. And the show in general, the immediate replay is on our YouTube channel. The podcast will be available shortly, courtesy of the hard work of Mr. Dave M. Inuk. Did you see what I did there? Dave M. Inuk. I thought that was kind of clever, but uh, there Look you go. Yeah, it's whatever, you, whatever you might want to say. Uh, if you haven't already done so, smash the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, leave us feedback, leave us comments on YouTube, leave us comments on iTunes, leave us comments everywhere. Happy Love birthday, Rob. Apparently it's Rob Mahoney's think. birthday. I'm not sure if that's that's true, but if it is, happy birthday to Rob too. There you go. A big thank you to all the sponsors of Illegal Curve who make the Saturday show, the post-game show, and Let's the website frosty. a possibility. Our friends at Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club. I actually think it might be Spencer's Spencey's birthday today, if I'm not mistaken. We what? might see that a little bit in the post-game. So maybe something to keep in mind there. Uh, I didn't for see that. I, I thought I saw Spencey that in the chat today. I thought I saw that on Wednesday that he that he. Yeah, may I think have said he that. says. I think he might have. He might have said that, but that could be a Weber thing where it's. His That's birthday. true. Every, every day is his birthday. Every day is his birthday. Uh, Linden Market Dental Center. That's our buddy, Doctor Les Rikus. Zapia Group Realty. Frank and Morrow Zapia. Betway. Tough Duck. Boston Pizza. Seagrams. Rollies Transfer. Grid Park and the Keg support these fine businesses because of their continued support of illegal curve hockey. We'll see everyone later tonight around eight forty-five for the post-game show. The three of us will be back to talk about everything to do with the Jets and the Panthers. Until then, have a great Saturday, everybody. If it's Saturday, it's the illegal curve hockey show live on youtube and all of our social media platforms thanks for listening to this broadcast from illegal curve hockey for more great illegal curve content subscribe to the illegal curve youtube channel follow at illegal curve on twitter facebook and instagram and visit your online home for hockey in winnipeg illegalcurve.com